Okay. We are going to uh, get started here. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, the first item of business is uh, to review and approve the agenda. It's funny, number two here, it says adjournment. There we go. That's kind of hilarious. <laughs> and we're done. Let's go. OK, cool. Uh, Jamie gets a raise. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right. Um, but actually, though, we're going to um, review and approve the agenda. Um, there are probably going to be some changes to the consent agenda, but we'll deal with that um, next. Uh, but uh, aside from that, um, I don't think there's any additions or uh, deletions from the agenda. Um, one thing that I do want to be really clear about is um, when we get to the part about the uh, validation resolution, uh, which is item eight. Uh, the validation resolution is pertaining to uh, the changing of um, some warning dates as well as the itemization of some funds. Uh, and so that is the, the type of thing that would be appropriate to discuss with item eight. And anything aside uh, from those two topics uh, would probably be um, outside of uh, what's pertinent to that. So if you have comments about uh, TIF or uh, like the, the um, the value of TIF or how much it was discussed, that I would recommend that you make those comments um, during item four, which is general business and appearances, which is next. Um, so that's all I have to say, generally speaking, about that. All right, so on to general business, business and appearances. So this is a time for any member of the public to address the council on an item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you would say your name and um, where you live, and uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes. Um, I've been a little lax on that in the past, but I am going to uh, attempt to actually hold people to two minutes. And uh, if you do go, you know, find that you uh, need more than two minutes, I just want you to know, like we wanted, we do want to hear you. It's okay. It's weird to hear your own voice there. <laughs> Um, we do want to hear you, uh, uh, and so I'd recommend that um, anything further, please email us. Uh, we do read all of that, um, and that, that's very helpful. So, um, but it is also good to get out of here before 10 o'clock, so, you know, we got to just keep, keep it going. Uh, all right, so any, um, anyone have anything they want to bring up um, that is otherwise not on our agenda? Okay, great. Move, uh, We've already spoken some, so what's left? <laughs> uh, I just, at your suggestion, took the issue of the uh, hybrid. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. And also where you live. Montpelier. OK, thank you. Uh, I took the issue of the uh, hybrid. Uh, I got clarity from the city manager. A hybrid ticket, which on an area that uh, had been parked uh, the ticket says park six feet from a hydrant. I went up and measured the current recurring stream of cars that park there, minimum nine feet from the hydrant. So our height, our ordinance does not reference six feet. It just says no car or horse uh, within in the general vicinity thereof. Uh, so we've got a problem with the ordinance. We've got a problem with uh, uneven enforcement, but. I'm happy to take whoever I need to take up there and prove that I can't. You can't park closer than nine feet without totally parking on top of the sidewalk, covering the entire sidewalk. So you need to clean up your ordinance, and you need to clarify that appeals uh, of a parking ticket need to go somewhere beyond the PD saying this appeal is final, uh, because then I'm told that it's to the city council or elsewhere. Um, the, I'm going to raise the parking thing for the benefit of the rest of the council. The, the new parking lot going in behind the Mowat property has 18 new spaces in it and anticipates trucks backing in from Main Street, uh, where the Main Street and Barry Street intersection, backing all the way in to Abishans. The truck drivers will not do that. They have, it's been clearly stated that they won't do that. The only solution needs to be planned now while that construction is still malleable uh, to possibly forfeit four spots 
in the North Branch lot behind Positive Park. Such so, Stephen, it's been about two minutes. Try, try to think about um, wrapping up. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did ask that the issues of CV fiber, EC fiber, this fiber on the heat plant, uh, and CVPSA be made formal agenda items because I've been bringing them up for a, over a year and they've not been put on the agenda and I can't fit them into my two minutes. Box. Fair enough. Uh, if you remember to email me, we'll see if we can find a spot for that on the, on the agenda. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sigrid Olson and I live on Main Street in Montpelier and I don't have anything to bring up. I just wanted to introduce myself and say that I'm a member of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory uh, committee and there's two of us here tonight and one of our goals is to make sure that we have members attending so just wanted to say hi great thank Thanks. you very much thank you, thank you. anyone else if if you're um, bringing up an item from the consent agenda we're we are going to take it up soon just so you know okay. let's see if something else it's hey. all good um holly wilkins president of united motorcycles of vermont uh, our organization has been, been conducting the uh, toy run to benefit Shriners Hospitals for Children for 32 years. It is always the second Saturday in August. It is always kickstands up at noon. It is a tradition for a generation of Vermonters who ride. Uh, they plan their weekends around it. They know the schedule. They don't need to consult anything. They just know what's going to happen, and we make it happen. Uh, the Shriners, and we have the potentate here, this gentleman here, are always very appreciative. We have raised over hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of toys and cash and checks that go towards research for the Triners Hospitals. Um, our chairman or chairperson for this committee uh, came here on April 4th to file for our street closure that we always do. Uh, he found out that the farmer's market had been granted street closure in our, in our time slot. Uh, we had not been given any, any heads up about this, which is kind of odd. Tony Fakos knows us. I thought maybe it, had, it would raise a couple of, you know, oh, isn't that when the toy run is? We didn't hear about it. Um, I immediately tried to contact uh, someone from the farmer's market to talk about it to see if possibly they could give up one Saturday. Um, and apparently they are down for every Saturday, which is great for them, 20, 26 Saturdays. All we need is a fraction of one Saturday to try to keep our, our current time slot because we know if we change this routine, we will lose participants. It's just a given. It's just so hard to get people anyway with their schedules. Um, so uh, the, the manager contacted me. Uh, she said they would be able to close one hour early, close at noon. But however, I guess it takes them two hours to break down. So she said that they could close at noon and we could come through at 2 p.m. I have to say, I'm sorry, but we, we cannot do that. We cannot change our schedule that much. So I'm going to interrupt you, mm -hmm. um, not because. Um, Your mic isn't working. Oh, is my not, mic not working? Yeah. I got to get closer. Oh, goodness gracious. OK. Um, we're going to uh, take this up uh, as a basically as a part of the consent agenda. So um, I'm going to ask you to come back. Is that OK? Absolutely. OK, <laughs> great. I already got two minutes in there, yeah, right? Yeah, there you go. Fair okay. enough. All right. Thank you. All right, I'll, thank I'll you. be listening. OK, sounds good. It'll be just a couple minutes. It just, just, yeah, it'll be really soon. Uh, okay, anyone else uh, for an item that's otherwise not on our agenda? Okay, so we're going to um, move on So to the consent agenda. Now, I know there are some items that people want to pull. Um, is there a motion or things people want to pull? How's, how's it now? Can you hear me? Uh, there you go. All right, thank you. All right, so we're taking O off the consent agenda. Um, I've got something yeah. to add also. Yeah. I've got a last minute liquor, first class liquor license request from the Abbey Group, which uh, does catering at the State House. And they were just advised to, even though they don't have a physical location, to just get a first class license through us. I also just want to mention, real quick, I'm sorry, in regards to the minutes, I just received a correction over email. And I just want to put out there and recognize it that I've already changed it online that item 19-165, paragraph 2, uh, the word mean has been changed to meet. There was a typo in there. So that is, that is now correct. And I, um, I assume if someone would uh, take item C off so that we can further discuss the toy run. I'll point, pull C. Okay. 
Is there a motion to uh, move the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Does that, that make sense? Second. Okay, further discussion? All right, uh, oh yes, do you have anything more for further discussion? If for not, the consent one. agenda? For the consent agenda, yeah. Um, first of all, I want to apologize because I have to leave early tonight, so apologies that I'll miss um, some agenda items. Um, the only thing I wanted to note that was on the consent agenda, um, I'm gonna vote in support of it, but was just looking at the um, plastic piping for our drinking water and having just been in uh, Bennington for an event on Friday and seeing the impacts of chemical contamination of drinking water on a community there and how devastating it's been. I, HDPE as a plastic pipe is one of the better plastics, um, but just something, and I apologize, I didn't have time to talk to Tom before this evening, so I just wanted to raise it as something that I hope we are already looking at, um, or if not, would love to talk with the uh, public works team on uh, just how we're looking at um, cost, performance, and um, just health impacts of different choices of piping that we're making. So I will have that conversation offline, but just wanted to raise it as something I was thinking about. Okay, there is, oh, any further discussion? Uh, on the consent agenda as uh, amended, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we're gonna immediately take up on these other two items, uh, and actually I think, um, I think we should probably do O first and then we'll do C, so um, yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jack. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I thought of this idea, I'll, I'll give people a general I idea, um, is this came up, uh, came to my mind last year when I was newly on the council and didn't come to me in time to, uh, didn't think of it in time to get it adopted. Uh, many people know that uh, June 19th is recognized, uh, especially in the African American community as Juneteenth, as the uh, end of uh, slavery in the United States. And so I have, uh, circulated and proposed a resolution uh, or a proclamation recognizing uh, Juneteenth uh, in Montpelier and I'd like to read it so people uh, know what the content is and there may be some discussion. Whereas the history of slavery in the United States is a history of unspeakable brutality and oppression and whereas the existence of slavery beginning with the earliest settlements in what became the United States and continuing through the Civil War was a betrayal of the values in the, the United States was created to defend. And whereas the proclamation to end of the end of slavery in Texas on June 19th, 1865, long after both the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War is widely recognized as the end of slavery in the United States. And whereas with the experience of over 150 years of history, we now know that the official eradication of, his, of slavery was merely a start to the continuing effort to liberate this formerly enslaved people and their descendants. And whereas June 19th, celebrated as Juneteenth, <coughs> celebrates African American freedom and achievement while encouraging continuous self-development and respect for all cultures, and whereas Juneteenth celebrates the fundamental promises of, promise of America and the need for all Americans to continue to work for universal justice and freedom, and whereas the city of Montpelier is committed to the values of liberty and justice enunciated in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution, and whereas the city of Montpelier is further committed to providing a home for all peoples and cultures to form the Montpelier community now, therefore, it is resolved that June 19, 2019, is recognized in the city of Montpelier as Juneteenth, and it is further resolved that the people of Montpelier are encouraged to celebrate the fundamental American values that underline the underlie the founding of our nation, our state, and our city, and to recommit themselves to the cause of liberty, justice, and acceptance of all people. And I move that we adopt this. I'll second. Further discussion? Um, I just want to say thank you, Jack, for um, making sure this was on our agenda and also for highlighting it and reading it. That was great. Um, any further discussion? OK. Uh, on, oh, comment? Yes? No? No, just uh, reiterating. It sounds okay. great. Okay. Thanks, Jack. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
All right, thank you. All right, so on to uh, C. So this is the item regarding the um, uh, uh, toy run on August 10th. Um, so if uh, uh, if you want to come back, actually you can come up and sit at the table if you'd like. Um, and uh, and I'm sure Tony, you probably um, also want to be. I don't know if you want to come up here and sit up here as well, or if you. you that yeah. If you want to, see, you can either sit facing the people or facing us. But those are mics that you can use. Yeah, so. sure. Your um, situation. Um, if you yes. Have more you want to add to that? Um, no, yes. Okay. I say. Well, in our last episode, I left off <laughs> at finding out that the um, farmers market was granted the slot that we have, and I contacted the farmers market um, manager, and she sent me an email. Um, and she suggested that she said that they were willing to close at noon, but and then that would allow us to come through at 2 p.m., which still is uh, time-wise not <laughs> not good for us. Uh, I we feel that the, the the responsibility of compromise perhaps should be on the newcomers who are in this spot for the very first time ever, who are for profit, who aren't doing a charity run. <laughs> Uh, rather than the people who have been in place for, for 32 years, are nonprofit and are doing a charity run, and are only asking for a, a fraction of one Saturday as opposed to the farmer's market who has 26 Saturdays you know, to do business. Um, and I guess that's it for me. Okay, great. Um, anything you all want to add? If not, that's fine, but... Yeah, my name's Don Hannum, former president of the UMB. Uh, I was down here before when they tried to shut us down for the street there a few years back. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for 32 years. I mean, it's all about the crippled and burned kids, you know? I mean, we, you know, like said, Holly said, hundreds of thousands of dollars in toys and, you know, and they're, they're gonna, you know, they're, they're, they're here for profit and they can't give us one day. You know, I'm just a tad bit annoyed, but. And this is the head of Heather Schreiner's. <laughs> Hello, my name's Michael Parent. I'm the potentate, or translated, that means I'm the president of the local Shriners, uh, the Mount Sinai Shriners out of Montpelier. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have United Motorcyclists support us with their toy run. Uh, I would hope that there's a, some sort of compromise that can be made so that their event can help us. Uh, they're wonderful. They bring basically three to four truckloads of toys in for the children. Uh, they do make monetary donations, which do go to the hospitals to help. I'm sure it was an oversight in the timing in the days that uh, may have caused the problem. I'm just hoping there's some way it can be worked around so that they can keep their scheduling and and it can continue to go on. Thank you. Uh, Tony, yeah. I'll, the only thing I just, for the record, is that we have supported, we being the Montpelier Police Department, have ordered officers in. We're the only department that does for 32 years. And I think I've only been able to ride in this event maybe once uh, because I'm working it usually. Uh, that being said, I just want to make that clear that the City of Montpelier, through the Police Department's actions and Public Works, always has and will continue to support this event. As far as compromise, and that's a, that's a key word, uh, I did reach out to, because I was not part of the original conversations, you know, with the farmer's market, but once we realized that, you know, the city worked, you know, uh, together to try to come up with a compromise, recognizing that there was an oversight, if you will, you know, because of when the permit came in. I did speak with Michael Burt um, after learning that the, the farmer's market was you know, going to close early, and we thought, well, you know, they give up an hour, you know, and, and, and we can, you know, there can be a delay in the ride start, and uh, by an hour, then that would be the compromise. That was how I left it. Uh, I, know, I know Mr. Burt did say he had to bring it to, to your organization for a, you know, it wasn't, he didn't have the, you know, obviously the, the, the you know, the sole say, and so right. here we all are. But I just want to let you know what the, what the, what the you know, what's happening behind the scenes, and again, just want to make clear that the city of Montpelier has and will continue to support the event, um, you know, just to get, th to get through that. So, yeah. uh, and whatever responsibility uh, there for communication, um, I also accept on behalf of the police department. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, the, and the other thing is, I mean, our permit that we set in, when we got the copy back, it had been whited out, 
and changed. everything been changed and without our consent. Without yeah, contact. Or you know, I mean, they didn't even tell us. Um, thank you. Um, uh, also, I'm wondering if there's anyone here from the farmer's market. If not, that's fine. Um, any other, uh, I know Vicki, you had something you want to say. Um, so you all don't have to hang out up here if you don't want to, but um, thank you. Um, and then, so we'll take some comments from the public and then we'll, I think we'll see about um, where to go from here. I, I just yes, didn't Don. hear it stated what time you wanted. Was it 1.30? Was it 1? What time did you want? We, we leave Blue Cross at noon. So at 12.30 we're coming from town. Okay, right. thank you. I just didn't have that time. Yeah, okay. Usually the street is closed, up, I think, an hour ahead of time. This is what we Um, oh, we'll, you can just hang out. Right we'll 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 we're going to be discussing this. Yeah. Uh, Vicki. Um, I only just heard about this tonight, since I'm here for another thing. Um, Vicki Lane and I live in Montpelier. I don't think that anything should prevent the toy run from happening as it's happened always. I think if the farmer's market has to either lose one Sunday or one Saturday or move back to 60 State Street, for one Saturday, I think that's fine. I don't think the farmer's market should get it over the toy run. Okay, thank you. Any further comment? Uh, Peter Kelman, I live in Montpelier. Uh, just, toy run is great. Everybody here would like to support the toy run for, for sure. I think characterizing the farmer's market as a for-profit activity really glosses over the fact that, the, toy, that the, the farmer's market has dozens of very small vendors whose livelihood depends on its operation. So I would just like us to make sure that we do actually work out a compromise. They've given up an hour. I'd like to ask the Toy Run group whether they could work a w out a way to also give up an hour so there is actually a compromise. It's an unfortunate issue, but I don't think that the farmer's market should be dismissed. We're talking about dozens of very small farmers. Uh, Steve Whitaker, uh, I would note that the market was moved onto State Street in anticipation of the Haney lot not being available due to garage construction. That's not totally correct. I can't hear you through that, your mic. That's not totally correct. But there, uh, other than about 20 feet where the bridge has now been installed, the lot is still there and available for, I don't know if they've added too many merchants, but it is possible that for one Saturday, the market could fit into and around the garage in the Haney lot and around. So I, I think honoring the, the seniority, especially when I've watched the seniority play out in the farmer's market, honoring the seniority of the toy run and the flexibility of the market to uh, take advantage of, it'll take a week of planning, but they could fit those merchants into the Haney lot and in and around the garage, even around the back of the garage. I'm sure the vet would cooperate. Uh, Etc. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Ken Russell. I live on Elm Street. Um, thank you for coming. I appreciate the toy run. I appreciate the farmers market. I think this is a great opportunity for these different groups to work out something positive. I'm my family's lived in Vermont forever, but I'm also kind of a transplant in other ways. So I'm part Flatlander you know, part tree hugger. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I can't help but note that that's part of potentially some conflict here. So I think, what, what, you know, I don't know how, it takes a while for the, how long does it take for the motorcycles to go through? Like from, half, from oh, you mean half hour to get through? I mean, no. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like there's gotta be yeah. something that in the spirit of working together and, and appreciating what each other are and not like negativity about this group or that group. Like, you know, maybe the, the, the farmer's market could have a great hurrah 
and, and get the place ready for 1230 or maybe you guys could move it a little bit or maybe I, I've probably shut off Langdon Street would just be a nightmare uh, but it'd be kind of fun to try no um, but but I, I think bottom line is this, the spirit of, of, of this is an opportunity to work things out and not and not be all like old oh, farmers versus motorcycles or whatever just to say it um, and all that okay. thanks Ken Thomas Moore, Prospect Street, Montpelier. Um, I ride in this toy run, you know, as much as I can. And it, it is, it's a, it's a good group of people that come from all over Vermont. And um, just to get the one time to use, you know, State Street, it is my street, and I am a resident here too. And I'd like to use State Street once in a while. I don't go to all the events that happen here. I mean, we, we closed down State Street for, what, presidential candidates, dancing in the street, parades and everything. You know, it's, it's let's share it with everybody, you know? I'd like to use it too, just one day, one day, you know? And uh, it is, it's a real good thing, and these people, they're not out there to raise hell and have a keg party, bonfires, mud wrestling, and all that. They're there, well, you can get biker parties like that. But this is just something that is for kids. You know, have you ever seen the commercial from Shriners? You know, it gets to you. And I'm, I would just like my city to give me maybe one day of State Street, one day. And then you can do your dances and do your farmer's markets. You can do parades. But just one day. <laughs> Not for me, but mostly it is for the kids. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you come up again, Stephen, I want to check to see if there's sure. anybody else who has not yet spoken. Oh, yeah. And it, you go ahead and come on over here and you just... Get in line too if you want. Uh, I'm Laura Smith Reeve. I live on Berlin Street. I am a farmer, have a small farm up there. Some folks might have noticed the sheep that have moved in up at the top of the hill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do not vend at the Montpelier Farmers Market, but I have vended at markets uh, for years. And uh, I would uh, put my vote in for the spirit of cooperation to find a compromise. Thank you. I wanted to agree with you about seeing if possibly the, the farmer's market could be extremely accommodating because even a small compromise will, will throw off things for the toy run phenomenally. So I don't have hard details, but I greatly appreciate the toy run. I also think, and I'm, I'm taking a big chance here saying this, that Montpelier has a reputation in some circles as being a tad snobby. <laughs> and I know that's not what this is about. I love the toy run. And I have done a lot of work with kids in foster care and with people who are homeless. And I'll tell you, one of my go-to groups, um, when I just want to say, hey, can anybody help me out with this, is this group. So I would really like to see the fabulous toy run really respected and allowed to continue in the same slot. So, And I would do anything I could to help, I don't know what it would be, but to help with any uh, communication that needs to happen to help make that happen. Before you I go, could you, could you just identify yourself oh, for the sorry, record? Thank you. My name is Lauren Sales. Thanks. Stephen, and we did also, you did also already have two minutes. No, I did not. She showed the one minute when I left. Okay, <laughs> okay fair enough. Go so, ahead. Uh, <laughs> one minute and 15 <laughs> seconds okay. to be exact. 45 seconds <laughs> less the amount you just wasted. Uh, the, as a technical possible compromise, uh, the, for that one day, the market could potentially be asked to lay out entirely in one lane and throw up some police tape and let them ride right through. If, if staff and the police tape solution works, it, it's a challenge, but it is possible compromise that would be exciting for both. 
Great, thank you. Anything further? If you want to, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Since this is about you, you, you know, get more time. <laughs> As we said, the, the spirit of cooperation is is vital lots of times and, um, you know, making compromises. I do want to point out that in the communique I got from the farmer's market manager, uh, she said that she has already, they have gone ahead and secured all of next year Sage Street, which I didn't know was possible, that you could do this a year in advance. I guess we could have done this every year if we knew this was possible, but they are in place for next year and advised us, the collective United Motorcyclists of Vermont, to make alternate plans, alternate routes, alternate times. Um, that is her, her message to us. Okay, all right, good to know, thank you. So um, I have a suggestion um, to make, which is uh, that I, I think we should, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, Vicki, did you already speak? I can't remember. Just briefly. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let's not forget all the kids and people that come out to watch the toy run. Yes. It's a big deal. Great, thank you. All right, so um, my suggestion um, would be that we, uh, I, I don't know that we're gonna be able to work out all the nitty gritty like logistics here tonight in this venue. Um, I'm fine with um, holding off on approving um, this for now in the hopes that um, the uh, folks from the Shriners and the Toy Run can um, again work something out uh, together with the, the farmers market, and because I, I also believe that you know uh, there there may be a solution out there that uh, that could work for everybody. So um, that's that's uh, that was my suggestion. Um, other thoughts from the council? I guess what I'm saying is I would recommend that we table it. Um, Donna, then Connor. Well, I, I would just like to get a re reaction. If indeed the route was modified, that you did go down Langdon Street, is that something that's been discussed with the police? Is that off the table totally, or is it a possibility? Um, just to go around them, Langdon, then back to State. I guess we would have to do like a site, a site review, um, because logistically it is, yeah, it's guiding safely. Mm -hmm. 600 plus motorcycles. Also trying to get to um, where where we park. We have the Red Knights motorcycle group. You, you should motorcycle. you should be at the mic so they can hear you. Um, yeah, and then uh, and, anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yep. And and maybe you don't want to get in the detail, but I just nobody mentioned an alternative route, and I just didn't right. Um, oh shock. <laughs> <laughs> Electric. <laughs> uh, it, just logistically, I guess figuring out if if the route would work with, with the amount of motorcycles, any, any different turns that we're well, it's making. A straight block so I guess, I mean, I'm not as familiar with Montpelier maybe as I should be. It's like State Street is here and one block over is Langdon Street. You have a one bank building to go around. Hmm. So tell me. Well, um, hey team, let's, okay. let's, uh, let's discuss that these details. Be if it was safe. Okay, I, I guess we would, time. we would okay. consider, yes, if, okay. if we could work it out with, with the police Great. and okay. such. Okay, we super, appreciate. thank you. Connor. So, so, care, yep, go ahead, Connor. Uh, no, totally agree with Tablin. So the thought is the city would play a role in facilitating the discussion there. We would try to get, and, we'll try to get the farmer's market and <clears throat> like together. We, we met with them each separately before and talked to, talk to people, but I think we need to all be in the same room and have a conversation. Yeah. Right. Okay. I, I, can I just say one yes, other thing? Yes, sure. I, I just want to say something that, it, make this completely clear. The city of Montpelier 100% supports the toy run and always has. And there, this issue is not about trying to prevent it from happening. And I know there were people here in the past that thought the city was trying to shut it down, but that wasn't the case. And you may recall it was a unanimous vote to support it that year. The city is the only city on your route that actually spends money to have police out at overtime and use our DPW and everything else, and we will continue to do so. So I just don't want anyone to think that the city of Montpelier is in any way against the motorcycles. It's a wonderful event. The children are wonderful beneficiaries, and we do support that. The farmer's market is also very important to our community. They, uh, they are struggling farmers. They're part of the ethos of our community, and they help support our downtown 26 weekends a week. They bring people to help support our businesses, and they provide also an equally valued thing. 
what we were hoping for is that there is some way that we can accommodate you both. It is hopefully the farmer's market will continue in the future and hopefully the toy run will continue in the future. And it seems to me that we can find a solution and it's got to be a safe solution. You're absolutely right, Holly, that we can't have by, you know, motorcycles going where they're, they're not, and I'm not sure about having a bunch of people on the street and them going by, so I, we, we need to work out safety concerns. But I'd ask everyone to take a deep breath, take a step back, and let's see if we can figure this out, because it's all good people here. And um, I do know, I'm not here to defend or, or speak for the farmer's market, but I also know that logistically for them, it's also a huge big deal. They've got things to set down. They've got locations for farmers. They've got to bring trucks in to get their things up. It's just, not, you know, they can't change on the fly that well either. And so if we can figure out a way to plan and do this right, we can really be a good model for everybody. Uh, Jack, and then I'd love to um, see maybe a motion on postponing. I'll but pass. That's it. Oh, okay. Is there a motion to postpone this item? Oh, or did you have something else? Just one short okay. yep. bit, uh, which is just to say that uh, as far as I can tell, this is still two months in the future nearly. It's the, the 10th. So I have every expectation that we will be able to work something out uh, either in terms of time adjustment or space adjustment. And, and then also I just want to say I'm sorry that I didn't notice that they were both scheduled for the same time. I do try to pay attention to that kind of thing and they both are really important things so and can i maybe just go ahead and make a motion to table the thing yes. at this point so moved so. all right so the motion is to postpone uh this uh item to a later date um next, next to the next meeting um till out uh, after two weeks from tonight june 26. Um, folks have had a chance to meet uh all right any further discussion oh there was a second i think Lauren seconded. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so motion passes. Uh, thank you all, and um, thanks for your attention to this issue. And now we can move on past the consent agenda. Okay. Um, all right, so we are up to the uh, Berlin Street speed limit uh, public hearing. So before I forget, I'm going to officially open um, the public hearing. Uh, so there's actually I'm I'm gonna let either you or Tom, Tom, and Tony <coughs> Tom introduce it. Great. <coughs> Welcome, Tom. Good evening. Yeah. Pull out my file. My glasses on. <laughs> What's that? We're not, we're not timing it. <laughs> oh, yes, that would be fine. Keep me on track here. So Tom McArdle, Director of Public Works. Um, this is the uh, consideration of a uh, engineering traffic investigation to determine the appropriate speed limit on Berlin Street from Granite Street to the Berlin-Montpelier boundary. The... Um, Recommended action is to consider the, the posted speed limit um, in the report. Um, this is a two hearing process, so asking the approved first reading and set the date for the second reading if the majority of the council agrees that an alteration of the speed limit is warranted. Um, <clears throat> this is a um, official action of city council. It's in accordance with state statute establishing the legal speed of a public highway. Um, the study that's presented is in accordance with the um, state statute, I, so I believe, as well as a manual of uniform traffic control devices. Um, so I cited the statute that's applicable. Um, so we conducted a, a, initially conducted an investigation of Berlin Street in 2010 and um, reached some conclusions that the appropriate speed limit is uh, 35. Um, and conducted a, uh, another investigation uh, this, this year. The speed limits are, um, are established by a uh, study to, uh, without a predetermined or pre-conceived um, outcome, the, um, so what, do the, what does the data uh, lead us to? And we utilize uh, um, I think six different factors, um, 
and reaching that conclusion. Um, so engineering judgment as well as actual uh, tabular da data. Um, notice that the, um, so I'll go through those briefly. There's the factor one with road surface um, and sight lines and alignment, uh, width, other geometric aspects. Uh, factor two is uh, actual speeds and I'll talk about that a little more. Um, what that means, um, why that's a relevant factor. Um, so roadside development or friction um, impacting the, um, the speeds and, and uh, driver behavior. Um, factor four is the um, uh, any specific areas of the of the roadway segment that may impact a speed. Maybe an advisory speed is warranted, or is it more of a wide ranging issue? Um, five is the, uh, again, the, the sides, friction, on-street parking, driveways, sidewalks, road shoulder, um, and six is uh, the accident uh, side of things. So speaking um, to the specific data, um, why the, um, known as the 85th percentile speed or the um, prevailing speed of, of free-flowing traffic is relevant is uh, the reason why the that's generally given great weight is that the um, this is an older thing I've got um, but I'll read that majority of drivers respond in a safe and reasonable manner uh, the normally careful and competent action of a reasonable person should be considered legal um, Laws are established for the protection of the public and the regulation of unreasonable behavior of the individual. And laws cannot be inf effectively enforced without the consent and voluntary compliance of the majority. So the majority um, of the drivers are, are looked at as 85% of the drivers will, motorists will adhere to a speed that is um, applicable appropriate for the actual conditions of the of the street whether whether that is narrow residential wide highway and then respond accordingly um, the misconceptions of speed zoning is speed limit signs will actually slow traffic um, will decrease the accident rate the posting of a of speed limit will increase the speed of traffic if it's raised um, the, so some studies that were done that um, about raising speeds and lowering them and how that actually affected driver behavior uh, really had little effect. It's what's, what actually is occurring on the roadway. Um, so the advantage of, of realistic speed limits to satisfy the requirements of state law, invite public compliance by conforming to the behavior of majority by giving a clear reminder to non-conforming violators and offer an effective enforcement tool to the police by clearly separating occasional violator from the reasonable majority. Um, we want to try to reduce public antagonism toward police enforcement of obviously unrealistic or unreasonable regulations. So the, the conclusion reached in 2010 was uh, based heavily, um, given a lot of weight based on the 85th percentile, reached the 35 mile an hour uh, conclusion, uh, reviewing this, looking at other other considerations, uh, primarily the um, lack of continuous sidewalks, uh, traffic volume is uh, one thing that was considered as well. Um, the functional conflict of a minor to arterial road passing through a residential area, um, and number of driveways, crosswalks, um, lack of, of reported good compliance with, with crosswalk, um, um, compliance with a, with a lot of yield. So the felt that the 35 miles an hour is somewhat excessive given the extenuating circumstances so that we shouldn't rely entirely on the 85th percentile or looking at the pace speed. And there's some guidelines about that uh, that I described in the report. Um, uh, braking distance, other factors. So we feel that although 
30 miles an hour uh, may lead, uh, cause otherwise law-abiding citizens to um, be a higher percentage of, of the violations uh, that we'd see on this street. Uh, I believe that the other, other factors affecting motorist behavior um, should be given greater weight and that the posted speed should be reduced to 30 miles an hour. So I'm open right. to take questions and uh, Jack. comments. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I heard from a constituent today who uh, raised the question. I, I mentioned to her that there is a proposal to reduce it to 30, and this person said, well, really, it should be reduced to 25, not 30, uh, drawing the parallel to uh, Main Street and College Street, which have certain uh, similarities, although they're not identical. And I wonder if you'd comment on that. Um, so again, we don't look at uh, the conducting of a, of a traffic engineering study, uh, what, the, what the outcome should be um, or hope to be. Um, and there's no basis of actual comparison unless there are true, true similarities in alignment, driveways, uh, other factors. Um, so the, the, the geometric conditions, the differences between Main Street, College Street, Northfield Street um, are, um, there's multiple, I mean, Berlin Street's 34 feet wide, um, there's a long continuous section, whereas uh, College Street is multiple blocks and, and shorter segments. Um, again, a speed limit doesn't mean that the speed can be maintained for the entire uh, length of the street. It's College Street, uh, I'm not aware of, of a recent study. Um, done of college, it may show that that speed um, uh, could be by the 81st percent percentile actually increase. So, speed limits that are long established um, are, in fact, grandfathered. Um, it's when a substantial alteration is made and, and re revising that speed limit where it must be supported by the study. Um, and I've been here for quite a while, and I don't remember ever having studied College Street or uh, Main Street was um, revised, and um, that was probably 20 years ago, um, and that's another another topic. But there are differences in width, alignment, grade, a lot of factors as, as identified in the report. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions? And then we'll take some public comment. Uh, Donna. So I want to make sure I'm understanding that in order to go lower than the state, we need this engineering study that to reduce the speed? That's correct. Um, the default is 35 miles an hour. If a town wishes to lower it below 35, it needs to be supported by, by a traffic engineering so study. So if, if we opted to make it more narrow and put a full bike lane there, and not just where the cars are or aren't, then would that help qualify it for 25? Um, it would um, warrant a follow-up study. It may come to the same conclusion. It depends on how that impacts um, um, all the various factors, how it affected the conclusions that are reached in reviewing each of those. So, Because there are crosswalks there. And again, again, I see people not able to react quick enough when somebody steps into sure. it. Sure. And likewise, when I'm trying to stay at the speed limit, or, or actually between 30 and 35, people ride my bumper. Yeah. And having been hit by a car 25 miles an hour on a crosswalk, I feel we should really go for 25 on most of our residential streets. You've got cars coming in and out, and you've got people, and we're encouraging bicycles. So I would try to do whatever I could to that street to help it qualify for 25. Um, yeah, so those, those alterations would need to be substantial enough that, that um, actually impacts uh, motorist behavior. Again, 85% of the motorists are driving at a safe and appropriate speed based on the conditions and, and the environment. So the crosswalks, pedestrian activity, the bike lanes, um, the numerous numerous studies have been done by Federal Highway um, about raising and lowering speed limits, 
um, but not so much about changing the, the actual physical characteristics of a roadway and how that affects driver behavior. So I suspect that would um, result in some, some behavioral changes and may, may lead to a conclusion that the speed limit should be lowered. But reducing it at this point under the current situation, you're more likely to have a significant amount of, of uh, because it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't relate or connect with, with what motorist is actually seeing and experiencing with optimal sight lines, mm -hmm. um, wider road typical, um, few, there's driveways, but there's good, good sight lines to them. It's more likely that there's going to be a tremendous burden on the police department enforcing potentially an arbitrary low speed limit. I think 30 is going to be uh, require the police department to, to extend a considerable amount of effort to educate um, the public to reach the 30 mile an hour speed um, because I, again it really is points to driver behavior and motorist behavior um, in these I know, situations. I don't want the motorist to dominate and I was around and I'm sure you were you were in the department when we re renovated that road and I thought the community the neighborhood was promised that even though this street was being smoothed out that it wasn't going to impact them and yet the faster the speed does because it is easy to go fast on that street so I feel we shouldn't help it and maybe that's one of those places we'll use the traffic coming but I feel it's a neighborhood and it needs to be treated as such and I believe that's the the reason why I reached the conclusion and discussing it with staff that um, the 2010 study should be reconsidered and that greater weight should be given to the residential setting and a minor, minor arterial. So there's, there's what we refer to as a functional conflict between the um, actual purpose and use of this roadway as a com connecting commuter route with its service, its, its use also as a land access, property access in a residential setting. So there's that is why greater weight was given to the the actual conflicts that occur their driveway pedestrian bicyclists um, those lanes have been added we don't see an awful lot of pedestrian use up there I believe there's probably just a lack of of comfortable feeling that that it's a good place to walk and be on a shoulder so thank you yep um i uh, connor and then let's take some comments from the public. Sure, just real quick. Any other speed studies being conducted at the moment, Tom, or anything you're watching? Uh, Northfield Street will be um, reviewed. It was substantially reconstructed, um, bike lane also, sidewalk, um, so that will be um, reviewed once we have some data co collected after the, now that the dust has settled and the construction's gone away. It's important that no actual influences occur while you're collecting the, the data. Um, and so that warrants a, uh, a follow-up study. So I don't know the schedule, whether it's this year or next year, but it will be soon. All right, I know we have some folks from the public who would like to comment, so come on up. If you'd introduce yourself and Gene, say where you live. Gene Leon, 265 Berlin Street. Thank you, Donna, for your comments and for finally bringing this to the table. I've been in the area coming to three years, and. I might be more in two minutes because I'm also talking for a lot of people that couldn't make it here tonight. Um, well, um, if you do, I'll let you know when you're at two minutes. Sure. And then, you know, my dad's, a, emails, my dad's been an engineer for 50 years, and he is a project city manager in Florida City, where school zones in Florida are actually 15 miles per hour. He is shocked that this neighborhood, which is a residential neighborhood in this day and age, when it was grandfathered in, when it was a rural farmland now it's communities with children with families with seniors with a bike path with pedestrian crosswalks school bus stops and public city bus stops so why for lack of a better word discriminated um berlin street northfield street goes has the same pitch uphill 25 miles an hour with less residents Uphill Main Street, 25 miles an hour. Same pitch going uphill. Elm Street, which is typically enforced, 25 miles an hour. College Street, 25 miles an hour. 
I work on College Street and I've gotten to know a lot of the residents in that area. And their main complaint is when speeders are speeding at a 25 mile an hour zone, guess what they're doing? 35 miles an hour. When speeders are going fast in a 35 mile an hour zone, they're doing 45, 50. I invite all of you to sit in my driveway during any traffic hour, including yourself, because you said there's not a lot of families, there's not a lot of, I don't know who we, because I have kids and there's a lot of families and kids who are constantly moving in this neighborhood. I invite you all to sit in my driveway during traffic hour and see for yourself whether it's with a speed gun or just plowing in the winter and you see how dangerous and unsafe it is. Talk about data. In 2016, there was an extensive data in Massachusetts and many of the urban areas. In 2017, after extensive studies, the 35 mile per hour zones were reduced to 20 miles per hour. So I want to let you know you're at two minutes. Okay. So just think about... Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, after... Yeah. Do you, does anyone know what the fatality rate is for doing 30 to 35 miles an hour? This is all data from a European study. It's 45%. The fatality rate, if someone was in an accident and hit someone, going 20 to 25 miles an hour is 5%. So these are factors. And now on behalf of uh, Christy Sternbeck, that also lives off Burning Street. She agrees to the 25 mile hour, and she's concerned that the flashing lights in the pedestrian crosswalks are not always visible or on, and, and that helps uh, eliminate traffic. So, and I have like, the best data is eyewitnesses, residents, citizens who live in this neighborhood. That is your best data, and, and a lot of us are here to speak, and I'll let them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki Lane, Berlin Street, and I've been there for 25 years, um, and this is not holding up. Um, no, forget it. It's good enough. I can yell. Um, that was an awfully nice letter to get in the mail. Um, I was expecting bad news until I read it. <laughs> now, I would be really happy with 25 miles an hour, because I've asked that before, but um, but I'll settle for 30 because that means they'll only go 40 versus 50. And maybe at 30, we won't be, our, our windows and things won't shatter from those ridiculous exhaust pipes and sound systems. Anyway, um, so I think I, this is great. Um, as far as pedestrians go, I don't know where you live, but there's pedestrian traffic on Berlin Street on the sidewalks. Um, the thing we don't have on Berlin Street is the other side of the street because you're taking your life in your hands to walk across the street and visit your neighbor across the street. Um, and when you're trying to clear your driveway of snow, it's, it's a real challenge, particularly for those of us on the hill because people just kind of slide down and most of the time they're on their cell phones anyway. But um, so I think this is wonderful. Um, I would encourage you, since we've now got these little flashing lights at these um, two pedestrian crosswalks downtown, that it is far more important to have them on the two crosswalks on Berlin Street because people don't stop. They rev up that hill and they slide down and if you're the unfortunate person to be in that crosswalk, too bad. So let's get some of those, that would be great. Mm -hmm. I think though in the outlying areas, those little flashing lights, I mean granted you have to push it, but eventually people will get educated. And as far as driving 30 and educating the public, they get behind me and they're gonna get educated. <laughs> Cause 30's it. Thank you, Vicki. 25 at night. Hi, everyone. Uh, James Brady. I live on Prospect Street. I actually wasn't expecting to comment tonight, but here I am for the next uh, agenda item. So I just uh, I wanted to put an idea out there, which I don't know if has been brought up before, but it's uh, what Burlington does and go a citywide speed limit. And maybe this is completely unrealistic, but 
it might be easier to to educate the public and have some more um, compliance if you know that if you're in Montpelier you're going 25 obviously with exceptions the interstate some of the state routes um, uh, I don't know if that's been considered at all or if that's something we might be thinking about uh, as a family who tries to use our car as the least amount as possible <laughs> Berlin Street yes I agree it can be scary and also um, if there is low pedestrian use I think that could actually be an argument um, in favor of kind of more thought because drivers are less likely to be thinking about pedestrians and so that interaction occurs less so they're less likely to be on their mind so just that's another another factor but I just wanted to bring up the idea of a, a potential citywide factor instead of trying to focus on little bits and pieces throughout the city um, just throwing that out there so thank you, thank you. Peter Lux Montpelier first want to say that this 85 percent idea is really bizarre to me and if that's a state rule we have to change this because I mean any kind of crime you could do if 85 percent of people do it it's okay um, the other thing is, I'm new to town, and any time I come down Berlin, I'm like, wow, look at that view. It's one of the most beautiful stretches in this town, and we treat it like a highway. Um, I'm also looking for a place to buy, if anyone knows anything. Um, and Berlin Street was on my list, but I'm reluctant, because I want to be able to get to downtown on foot or bike. And it's really not safe. There are bike paths, but it is very risky to bike up Berlin Street. I can tell you that. And so it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. If the bicyclists are not comfortable to bike up Berlin, then the drivers feel like they can go as fast as they want because they've got the road. Um, so saying that it, you know 85% of people drive 44 miles per hour and that that should influence what the speed limit is, is a little silly. Um, and so the other thing I want to mention is that I believe that area is seen by the city as kind of a growth zone where future development could take place. It's really not far from downtown. So if we don't make it possible to walk or bike there, we lose an opportunity. And there are people who consider those areas who would walk and bike to downtown. Thank you. Hi there, my name's Mary Carol Dobbins. I live at 300 Berlin Street at the top of the hill at the corner of Sherwood Drive. And I can say from personal experience, this is a regular occurrence that I am blown away by how fast people drive by my home. They're coming off the hill from the Walmart and the hospital and they make no regard whatsoever, have no regard whatsoever that it's a residential neighborhood. They've entered the city. They're in the city of Montpelier now. And I had six legislative pages stay with me from January to May of this year, and I can and they're from around the state, and I can tell you and that they all commented, along with their parents, that they were afraid on that street, and they were afraid to let their kids walk down to the state house. I hear this all the time. The family center is at the on Sherwood Sherwood Drive. There are children and very young children and parents who have to use that road to access to get to the family center. We should encourage that and not scare them to death to get there. When I shovel my drive of snow or mow my grass, I have literally repeatedly been blown off balance by how fast the cars go by me. And I'm, I need to be able to access to take care, to take care of my property. And it's just ridiculous. And it is not an occasional occurrence. It is repeated. So um, again, it's our neighborhood. It's a, it's a beautiful street, and I appreciate your comments. And so many people live there. It's a large, active neighborhood. And if people are not walking it, it's because we're afraid to walk it. We would like to very much more often walk it. And so please protect our safety. We'd appreciate that. 25 miles per hour will be ignored to a certain extent. People will drive faster than that. Please keep it to 25. Because they, as they go down a hill or come up a hill, they're going to accelerate some. And the police can understand that. If we keep it to 25, people can adjust their habits. They will. We do it all the time. And so we'd appreciate your consideration to please change the speed limit to 25. Thanks. Welcome. 
Hi, good evening. I'm, my name is Noah Sexton. My wife and I live on 200 Berlin Street. And I can tell you, uh, Gene's correct. You know, I know all the data and everything, but cars zip by all the time. You know, we walk our dog every day, and it's just amazing how fast cars are going up and down. When we sometimes have had the flashing sign to showing the speed, you know, you'll see 37, 40 <coughs> miles an hour. So, and it is a residential area that's even, I've been, we've been there four years now, and you're having young families now with kids, uh, the crosswalk, and it's really scary for the kids and everything and the pedestrians going across. And like you say, it's, we're part of the city. And uh, I was thrilled when they said we're gonna drop, maybe drop the speed limit. And like you said, 30 is a start, 25 would be better but uh, really think we should drop the speed limit. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, speaking in my capacity as a resident at 209 Berlin, um, I can kind of agree with everything that everyone has said. One of the things I think is a major concern for me on my property at the corner of Berlin and Wilson is that there's a bus stop right there and every single morning at 7.40, 7.45, families come down Wilson Street from the neighborhoods with with little kids on the street and there is no there's no sense of anyone stopping um for the for people in the crosswalk particularly little kids going to the school bus so reducing the speed limit i understand the technical side of it i get it but you know what it like in that neighborhood i'm seeing so many kids these days i've got three so you know, geez, I just jumped the population, but um, but 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 you know, it is it's really important because we do have a lot of people walking in the neighborhood or would walk more if they had that opportunity. The sidewalks are narrow on that on that far side. Um, you know, I would give up some of my property for sidewalks. It's yeah. So thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Tilly. I live at 276 Berlin Street. Uh, we've been there 52 years, and that's back when it was it was a paved road, but there was no uh, no traffic like there is today. Uh, a couple of my biggest problems, and I'm in favor of lowering it to 25. Uh, we live up at the top on the left-hand side of the road, just uh, this side of the curve. And when I back out every morning, there's nothing coming that I can see on that curve. But by the time I get out into the road and into gear to start to go down, I've got someone right on my tail. And that's almost every single morning at 7.30. And in the winter time, I had to stop mail delivery because I can't get across the road to shovel in daylight hours uh, with the traffic going the way it is. It, it almost seems like some of them take pride in seeing how close they can come to you because I'm out there trying to shovel and it just whiz, whiz, whiz. And uh, it just, it, so, and they're, I think they're going 40, 45 seems to be the normal regardless of what the stats say. So just, to, just for that comment. I'm Laura Smith Riva. I live at 286 Berlin Street. I mentioned earlier, some folks probably have seen the sheep up there at the top of the hill. Uh, that's us. And uh, it has been very shocking to see uh, the traffic uh, uh, flow on that street and the speed. But the thing that I noticed that really was um, hard for me was the number of school age children who are walking past my house, which is I would, I'd like to say, too, I would offer up some land for sidewalks if there was anything left there, but there isn't. Uh, there's no sidewalk there. The sidewalk ends at Hebert Street, and kids are exiting the sidewalk onto what I guess is being called the bike lane, although it's hard to understand that concept given, um, given that area. So I don't understand how the city would want to have school-aged children walking on that street with traffic flying by there, you know, approaching speed limits of 50 miles an hour. It's unreal, honestly. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is, is there is 
when you get to the top of that hill, there is a curve there, and then you have Sherwood Street. And effectively, what's been created there is um, a mechanism for people to bypass the Route 2 traffic during rush hour, and so they just come racing up Berlin Street and then drop down on Sherwood, which is a 25 mile an hour speed limit, and they've had a lot of uh, complaints from what I can understand from, at least from reading Front Porch Forum, uh, with the traffic speeding on that road to, to avoid, you know, hitting the roundabout over there on Route 2 to come, to come back down that way, or they're, or they're going out to the Barry uh, uh, artery there. And so we've created this, this arterial uh, highway in a residential neighborhood simply so that people can bypass the traffic down on Route 2 and, and effectively go faster than people are going on Route 2 half of the time. So it just seems like a real, um, a not very good situation up there, but particularly for the kids. And I have watched people out there trying to shovel, you know, their driveways, you know, folks there are a couple of my neighbors are elderly and they are it's definitely um, a challenge and we've been quite challenged to figure out what to do with the snow uh, in our area so I got one more minute um, what do I want to I, say I in one have, minute I have to say actually I, I have I you as oh she's, I, I was, she's uh, saying stop you know, okay I so I I will stop I, I am in favor <laughs> of reducing the speed limit I understand I read the the, the study in the 85th percentile I'm having a hard time with that. Maybe something's different between 2017 and now, but um, I'm in favor of reducing that speed limit and doing whatever we need to do to make that area motorist, uh, uh, to create awareness for motorists to slow down. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name's... Melissa Kasarek, and I live on Pleasant View Street, which is parallel to Berlin Street. And I didn't actually know that there was a proposal to reduce the speed until just tonight. I'm the mother of two small children, and my husband and I like to try and take advantage of downtown Montpelier as much as we can. And when the weather is nice, we like to try and take the stroller. Um, double strollers are not convenient vehicles, no matter how good the sidewalks are. But it's actually really difficult to manage to get into this crosswalk. It seems almost like the it's a really tight corner. Um, hopefully we can keep them in the double stroller for a little bit longer because, I mean, the alternative is having one in a stroller and trying to wrangle the other one on a very busy street. Um, I also was not aware of the fact until very recently, I'm a somewhat new resident of Montpelier, that there were no buses um, after a certain point to school. I don't think I'm a very overprotective parent, but I could not imagine sending a small kid down Berlin Street to walk to the public schools every day. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm gonna do when I get to that point. I have a few more years to deal with it, but I think that reducing the speed on Berlin Street would certainly help with a lot of the issues. Thank you. Let's see if there's anybody else, Vicki, who has not yet oh, spoken. I'll be very brief. Okay. I do not live on Berlin Street. I have no selfish interest in it. I travel Berlin Street frequently. I have to use cruise control to make sure I don't violate it. I've caught myself doing that. Uh, in fairness, I would encourage the 25 to be comparable to Elm and Northfield, that in effect you'll be retraining those uh, in a hurry traffic people to find another route. But to protect, this shouldn't be a, a lesser grade neighborhood uh, and treat it as such. Uh, I would encourage you to send them back to, to do it, come back with a 25 proposal. <clears throat> Lauren Sales again, just a couple quick things. Um, the crosswalks, people warn new people in the neighborhood not to use them because unless the lights are flashing, it's like they're not even seen. It would be less dangerous if they weren't there because people are so conditioned to think it's safe to use a crosswalk. Um, it's very scary. I've known multiple people who've grabbed people out of them. Um, and the other thing I was wondering about is, you know, I actually got a couple of tickets quite a few years ago in that area. 
it's very open and going faster makes sense. And then without a lot of indication, you're suddenly in a residential area. And I, I think it suddenly becomes Montpelier. Isn't there a town line there? And I wondered if there, as part of the whole picture, if maybe there could be a welcome sign or something that had some psychological impact that you're about to go around a corner and there will be children and houses and dogs. Um, because the change does happen really quickly. Um, a little like reduced so. speed ahead kind of thing. Yeah, or, but not just that, maybe welcome to Montpelier or great. something like that. Great. Thank you. Nope. Um, before you go again, Vicki, um, I want to see if there's anyone else who has um, not uh, spoken who would like to. All right, Vicki, you've already had two minutes, so is it, is it super Did short? Did I have a full two minutes? No. No, no, no. Oh, no, good. No, 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 no. Um, I, are there are there flashing lights at those two crosswalks? No, I didn't think yet. so. Um, the um, now I've forgotten. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Vicky, you can always. This is just the first public hearing. If you have more to say, why don't we save it for the next one? Okay. Well, I'll remember eventually here. Um, I do like the citywide. 25 mile, I think Barry City does that too. So I don't see why we can't um, do much. that. I mean, that's a good thing. Um, hey, so Vicki, I am gonna, I am gonna cut you off. Uh, you, you've, ha you've had two minutes and I'm gonna try to, is it, is it really brief? It's really brief. It's really brief. I just wanna mention as a new resident, I used to, I used the GPS to get around and find my way around and it will actually send you up Berlin down Sherwood instead of River 2302 because it thinks it's the fastest route. So it's not just people who want to take a shortcut. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure there's Can lots I of... Just, I remember just one thing. Well, can, let's, save it for, let's save it for next time. It, it won't do it next time. I'm sorry? You can send us an email. How about that? Like I'll we just we need to keep. There you go. We just need to no we need to keep going. And I want to be consistent, right, um, with with well, folks. So, uh, okay. So um, it seems pretty obvious that we're going to at least reduce it to thirty. Uh, that seems pretty clear. And it also um, seems uh, at least very interesting to me to reduce it to twenty-five. But. I want to clarify something with you, Tom. Um, you said in order to change the um, speed limit, uh, basically you need a study to support that. Is that more or less true? That's correct. Okay. So, um, I mean, I have a suggestion, but I don't want to cut other people off. Well, uh, I, yes. I would just be really interested in researching the total 25 for the whole city and less in some areas. There. If that makes sense. If I could respond to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I did have a couple of just follow-up comments. Um, but the Montpelier is currently, does currently have a 25 mile an hour as um, overall speed limit unless otherwise posted. Um, I don't think we sign it very well and I just actually was looking at that um, and what's recommended in the, on the manual. So uh, that is currently in place and has been for a long time. No, it's, I said, unless otherwise posted. Um, so that is currently to, to then change all the speed limits to less than 35 miles an hour, um, if it's already posted at that, um, does require, by state statute, the, the conducting a, um, a traffic and engineering study. It must be supported by that, or your tickets will be challenged, and you'll, and you'll probably won't prevail in court when that is, when that is cha challenged. So. The, the study has to be prepared. Um, I'm less clear about whether council has the prerogative to deviate from the results of that. I believe you're allowed to. Um, I can't change what I've concluded, um, but that is, um, I would have to find out perhaps a legal question whether or not a, a speed limit does not, that is set that is not supported by the study would be, um, would still be, prevail. A um, couple of quick questions, if you don't mind, sure. or uh, answers. Um, we are looking at um, the sidewalk extension from Hebert Road to Sherwood Drive. 
um, that is uh, will be designed and a funding uh, request for that will be possibly through a grant um, on Sherwood Drive when we paved it repaved it last year we um, altered drainage uh, structures and um, in anticipation of a sidewalk on one side of Sherwood Drive um, from Berlin Street to Forest Drive so we are working on those um, alterations we realize the need for pedestrian connections and prefer not to have people walking the street would like to see more people walking uh, and last the the flashing lights on the crosswalks is in the um, is in the works and that's something that's being looked at by the uh, by the transportation committee so. so something that seems clear to me as well from um, all the comments by the way Berlin Street congratulations on like having such great representation that was that's excellent I'm so impressed um, uh, it seems clear that the speed limit is even just one factor um, among many um, here you know it was brought up if, what if there was a sign that gave people a visual or psychological cue that uh, you know something was changing um, I know there are other traffic calming um, measures that can be ta uh, you know looked into. Um, I mean, that might be street narrowing or adding a sidewalk, and I don't know what the possibilities are for that street, but um, now is probably not the time where we're able to figure that out, but it seems like it would be really worth um, looking into up, uh, even other strategies to help reduce uh, speeds, because I mean, we can change the speed limit uh, even to 25, and, and if that's not what people are doing, it may not, it still may not register um, with people, and still, people still, um, it may still be normal for people to go excessively fast. So there that's need right. to be some other, um, other cues there to, to help, I think. Agreed. Um, there will be a uh, reduced speed ahead sign on the approach from Berlin, so I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Um, I think the idea of a welcome to Montpelier sign is a very good idea. Um, and if we were to, uh, so I'm very interested if we can look into this legal question about whether the council has um, jurisdiction to deviate um, from the recommendation. Um, perhaps we do. That would be wonderful to know. Um, if we are not, uh, then I think it would also be interesting to look into, um, sort of as Donna, you, you were sort of suggesting that maybe if we if we do some of these other strategies that. 30 might be what we do for now, and then we implement some of these other strategies and then take a look at it again, um, and the report may then come back um, recommending 25. Um, so that's, uh, at least that's how it could play out, unless, of course, we have other authority. Yeah. Well, and just in case everyone else doesn't know, the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee has been looking at a traffic calming policy, which offers many different ways. And they could take on this street as an example of applying the policy that the city has adopted. That would be excellent. Okay. okay. Um, so we have a first reading. We have another one in two weeks, and we can look at some of these some feedback okay. for two weeks. Great. Is it brief? Because there's, no, there's another yes. hearing. There's a whole other hearing. Um, it, the, the problem is, so let's wait, let's do 30 now, we'll wait another two years. People want this now. I mean, this will not continue to, regardless of, of, of your inconclusive data, in my opinion. I mean, there's no police data here. I mean, there's no enforcement. So there's no, you know, where the traffic citation data. I mean, we don't have that. The, the, the people can, I can get a petition for over 500 people in this area if necessary. The city has an obligation to keep citizens safe, yes or no. So the council has the power to make a citywide 25, that's an amazing proposal, 25 miles per hour, citywide. You guys have the power. You have been voted by the citizens that live here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have some things to investigate for next time. Uh, and uh, so we'll, I don't know that we need to alter anything substantially at this point, uh, but we'll have another reading on this to revisit this um, in two weeks. Can, can I? Um, hang on, um, <coughs> Donna, did you have Do, do you need a motion to close the hearing? Um, no, I think said it. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna, um, is it very? Is it very, very brief. Yeah. Can, can I recommend that you ask PD to do strict enforcement to actually build some data between the two hearings? Well, we can we can dig up some data. How about that? Well, I mean, strict enforcement would 
Speaking of Sherwood Drive, can you repaint the yellow line on Sherwood Drive so people understand that it is a two-way street? A lot of people seem to think Sherwood Drive, they can drive straight up the middle or down the middle. Repaint a center line? The, yeah, the yellow, whatever color that is, the center line. So they know it's a double. <coughs> there, there's two lanes on that street because it's... That's, I'm going to say that's probably that's, a question for another but time. But, I mean, that's just my suggestion. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, Connor, and then uh, I think we need a motion to um, have our second hearing, unless you want to do that. Well, I think there's consensus to move uh, in this direction, so that I'd approve to uh, I'd, uh, move to approve the first reading and set the date of the second reading to June 28th. Six. Six. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I just want to comment, oh, yes. Tom, I really appreciate your lengthy memo that lays out all the six standards. It was very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it has been about an hour and a half. Do you want to break, team? Yes. Um, let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll be back with the Conservation Commission. Yes. Uh, so we are up to um, the Conservation Commission updates. Yay, welcome. <laughs> if you would uh, introduce yourselves. Great. Um, I'm James Brady, current chair of the Conservation Commission. Paige Gurton, Conservation Commission member. And I'm Michael Zorchak. Also a member. Member. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, so on a personal note, I, uh, my term is up this month and I will not be asking to renew. It's, it's been four and a half years and um, it's a tough decision. We have a lot. I'm just kind of looking back at the notes or even just the last year, and there's a lot of really amazing things going on, but uh, with personal life and just kind of knowing when, <laughs> I don't, I want to get to the point where I get kicked off. <laughs> so I was just kind of like, okay, this is, this seems like a good time. So, um, you know, getting a little tired, been there four and a half years, so I think it's, it'd be good to kind of give somebody, um, kind of empower somebody new to kind of take over the reins and um, as you'll see we have a lot of really cool things going on for somebody to, to and the rest of the group to sink their teeth into um, so uh, we're thinking just kind of going over what uh, what some of our highlights were in the last year since we we last met with you um, and it's there has been quite a bit which um, which is which is awesome um, and then I'll let uh, Michael and Paige weigh in on some of the details of our um, more particularly, this our stormwater project, which has gotten a lot of traction lately, uh, a lot of excitement, even some news just from later or earlier today. So, um, so we uh, one of our big events of the year, we were able to co-host the Bio Blitz with North Branch Nature Center, and it was awesome. It was a total success. You know, there's 600 uh, plus participants, people driving from I think all, different, all parts of the country. Um, to uh, to to offer their expertise, uh, thousands of observations, and um, it, it 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 just it was really inspiring, and uh, we were really excited to to be able to co-host and um, and help use some of our uh, funding to support some of the um, what, what was needed for that event, and and, and not only that, we were, we got some incredible data um, that few other cities, especially cities of our size, that um, get in terms of present you know ecological baseline that we can use to inform us in the future so it was like basically hiring uh, 500 consultants for one day so it was it was incredible uh, we're really really uh, excited about how that went and um, they, they all the data is online and um, and it, it was the second one in 10 years so there might be events like it in the future but so that was an incredible success um, I'd like to jump right into um, the stormwater uh, topics that we've been we've been focusing on, and as a conservation commission, um, we kind of we sat down about two years ago to decide what, what what makes sense for our size, our scope, the city, um, and and stormwater rose to the top pretty pretty easily. Um, we have a lot, you know, an urban compact, in a confluence of multiple rivers, um, and a stormwater issue that goes all the way to the lake. So. 
um, that that was the top of our priority and um, Paige and Michael kind of took that and ran uh, as fast as they can, could and have been doing that for a year and a half now so <laughs> please Paige take it away oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, Michael and Jamie Bates and I have been working on um, a rainwater collaboration, a stormwater collaboration with the credit union um, to build a rain garden on their property to um, infiltrate water from about a quarter of their parking lot. And the rest of them are another plan for future. It's the same um, place, credit union. Yes. And um, so in the fall, we put together a grant and we got. Um, we got a grant allocated to do that. Um, that happened in November. Um, the credit unions all over it. They think it's a great idea. They really want to reduce their impact. I've been very impressed working with them. Um, and so slowly, slowly, we've gotten all the bits and pieces together. Um, and we finally, about two weeks ago, got the, um, what's the official grant documents from the funding agency and um, sent out an RFP to about 10 companies. And as of today, today's the due date, as of today, I have at least four proposals that I've seen so far. I haven't read any of them, but that's really exciting because I wasn't sure we were going to. Some of them came out of the blue. Um, it was on the city website, and we worked with a a professor from UVM named Mark Companion, who is also, which Michael got in touch with, who um, also is involved with the Clean Water Initiative at the state and the Sea Grant program, which is part of the funding agency. So, um, so that's proceeding slowly, but we're getting there, and that um, hopefully that's this will be a template for future projects, public-private collaborations that we can do in support of the city stormwater master plan. So that's the goal, and it's it's happening. Great. Yeah. Uh, any questions on any that, that topic? Comments? To... Okay. Any questions? Anyway, we're really excited about that. It's high, it's uh, it's going to be kind of a high profile site with the bike path, so um, a lot of education and, and high outreach school opportunities. And yeah. It's right on on um, Bailey Avenue, so it'll be really visible. Yeah. It's going to be so, really exciting. And we're going to have um, a party. <laughs> yes, excellent. Yes. A cleaning party every year to make sure it's correctly. So uh, yeah, so that's just that's just the first of our stormwater projects. Yep. So the hope is to kind of um, use the city's stormwater master plan um, as a way of guiding conservation commission to either a help public works or b help other foundations or or c um, kind of picking away at some of these smaller ones that might even be just you know the lower hanging fruit uh, that we could do um, with. with without so much support. Um, so yes, yeah, so thanks yeah, to everybody. Hopefully this will be a template for how we can do it or how we can not do it next time. So yeah, it's a start. So, it's a whole you. new thing for me. <laughs> um, so moving on, the, uh, over the past year, we also um, finished up some of our um, projects related to vernal pools. And one of them was as simple as just completing fencing around one of the pools in Hubbard Park wire fencing so oh sorry oh yeah apologize um so fencing around one of the vernal pools near the uh, structures at hubbard park and basically what that means is so um some occasionally a dog would get in there and there'd be silting or or other um or predatory actions from from you know uh, natural um uh and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, so that was a very simple project, but it's very effective, and um, that pool has been very productive even just this spring. So that was uh, a simple project, but very successful. And um, when John Jose was a commission member, he helped use our city with our our really good baseline data on vernal pools um, to help do a proof of concept for a model um, that the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab, along with um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies has been working on to predict vernal pool locations throughout the state using existing mapping. So LIDAR, if you're not familiar with that, you know, 3D imagery, basically. Um, and so we had the data and we had a little bit of funding, so we were able to use that funding to get a consultant to run the model and the model hit existing vernal pools. So it proved the model was working correctly and it was, it was really exciting 
for both for both parties, and now we we have another data set that we're excited to have in our That's our a tool belt. Science. Yeah, science, That's and it was science. it was cheap and easy, and so we were really excited about that <laughs> that project. Um, the um, we were also we've been involved with the um, the public outreach and kind of thoughts and concerns of Confluence Park, and so we've been really happy to partner with uh, the River Conservancy. On that project, we helped to use one of our meetings for their public outreach, which was really successful. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then so we're, we're definitely excited to continue with that, that process in the future, because that's going to be, um, I think, a real gem for the city um, as, we, as we start to finally focus back in on, on the rivers. So that's, that's a high priority for us, and we're really excited about how that's going. So um, another, another success from last year. Um, so one of the other topics that has been high on our list of priorities has been outreach and education, and it's been a slightly harder nut to crack just because of um, time and energy from you know already busy volunteer staff. So um, that's something hopefully we can kind of continue to evolve. And a, a few things that did go on were um, like Paige and I don't know if Jamie went to, but there was some some uh, participation at the farmers market. At least once yeah, last I went year. Once. Yeah, yeah, so I just to start, you know, just to, to do that more, but but we now have a logo, which we're also very excited about, and so that just that kind of having that presence, and we we're able to use that logo, for instance. Um, Bring us a copy. No. Oh, I could it can get you in any form. Yeah, we can uh, send you a, a link to it. But um, we we were able to use that logo uh, at the Bio Blitz, so we kind of that was a good way of kind of debuting and kind of getting that recognition out beyond. You know the core group, so that was um, one of the ways to kind of start the the outreach uh, portion of, of our priority. So that's something we, we're going to have to kind of um, work on to evolve uh, as things go on. Um, one of and then the next kind of big item that we started to sink our teeth into recently was our participation um, for projects that require. Conservation Commission review for the new zoning, and um, we are not planners. Um, so it was, hey, you know, we're really excited about this language in here, but what does it actually mean, kind of deal. And so um, we started to have um, some folks from uh, the city, the planning office, and um, the DRB come, and they spoke with us recently, and it, it kind of it became clear that 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 process even. Um, even if we don't participate very often, we have to um, we have to get our ducks in a row, and there's going to be quite a bit of work um, for us to to do that. Um, and so that kind of brings me to one of the, the biggest points I wanted to bring up um, to the council is uh, we're uh, really interested in and um, uh, want to kind of get some more insight on how um, the Conservation Commission could get more um, formal and more regular staff support um, as, we, uh, as we continue on. Because our projects, as they evolve, as this is just from one year, are, are, they can get unwieldy pretty quickly. And um, it's not that we can't handle it, but if we had some, some support from even just some administrative support or some guidance for um, internal communications, um, I think that this group would be um, taken to the next level. So um, I, n I understand that that might there might be some st you know staff changes going on um, throughout. So um, whoever that I know understand that some other committees and groups have a dedicated person that um, can 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 offer at least a few hours of their paid time to help. So I'm just curious to see if we could flesh that out a little bit better. Um, Moving forward for this group to, to kind of continue on this this growth um, to make it successful. So I wanted to, to make sure that that was was mentioned and um, uh, brought up because, like I said, we're continuing to grow. We're taking on bigger and bigger projects that are um, getting really great traction, and we want to continue to be successful without you know burning people out. So, um, but thank you for for letting us kind of talk about our our year in review and. Um, and what we're looking at in the future. I think coming up, um, it's uh, it's going to be a, a slight continuation. The stormwater project is going to take up quite a bit of time, which is not a bad thing. I think it's going to 
to make sure it's successful, we're going to have to make sure that the time and effort is, is put in there to um, to to uh, to make sure that that is done on a you know in a in a good time frame, and also that's going to start to include more people. For instance, um, maybe more student involvement for the high school, which is right across the street. Uh, we have two student members right now, which is awesome. Uh, a fifth grader, uh, Jasper, and a high school student, Ian, which has been awesome. Um, so having liaisons through the schools, through them, is uh, gives us uh, an easy conduit to, to kind of involve even more of the, the student population. And then we have a nice project that they can get their hands literally dirty on. So that's really <laughs> exciting. Um, so. Yeah, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments or... Any questions? Uh, Don? Well, it's not a question, but thank you for your service, James. Oh, thank you. And, and, and you too, Paige, and Mike, and your whole group, and I'm glad that you're getting more out there, letting us know what you're doing, so we can appreciate you as well as maybe give you some cha some challenges along the way. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. The company would have reappointed you, too. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple of years. I'll, uh, <laughs> when I can, uh, yeah, when I, yeah, right. I was going to say, we can, first of all, thank you as well, but we can follow up, you and I, about what your staff needs are. Thank you. Yeah. And I understand there are a lot of constraints already. So Everybody's mean, running so thin, so totally understand that. But And thank you for the reminder about the uh, youth participants. I want to make sure that we're on track to um, find more uh, youth on to, to be represented on boards again the following year it's and great also, and thank you yeah we were I was able to write a letter of recommendation for former members awesome. and it's it's just it's just awesome yeah yeah, yeah. It's really cool. totally awesome so thank you any further uh, Glenn just a very uh, casual question for, for uh, anyone who might not know what vernal pools produce you said that the one in, in Hubbard Park was very productive and oh I just wonder, good point what, what was it producing uh, with his uh, wood frogs, and I think that there are spotted salamanders in that particular pool. And uh, so vernal pool, you know, it's ephemeral, um, dries up, and that's important because that way fish can't establish. And so it, um, it's it's a pool that's wet long enough to support the um, the phases from egg to larvae to um, to a full adult that can walk out of the pool but then dry out. So it's a very specific window and it's uh, very rare and that's why um, even if they're very small they have the highest protection for the state wetlands. Oh, not the highest, but um, they're regulated as if they were a significantly larger wetland. Um, and so, um, yeah, they're incredibly important even for their size. They, they might not dry out this year. The, the fish may yeah. start moving yeah. in. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's how things were, you know. It's a Thank you. Sure. Thank you all for your work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we are now up to the uh, validation resolution, um, item eight. Uh, we had at one point anticipated uh, going into an executive session. I don't think we will likely do that. Uh, so this was a postponement um, from the last meeting. Um, we had a letter from uh, James Dumont and the, uh, representing the appellants. Uh, sort of in a late sort of hour uh, last time, and so we decided to postpone and um, also had a response um, from our lawyer. And so we have uh, read through uh, both uh, both uh, that both of those letters, or uh, James Dumont's letter, as well as uh, our lawyer's response. Um, and so uh, I, th I think uh, we might have a have a motion. I'm not sure, but go, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I would like to make a motion that we approve validation resolution. I'll second. Further discussion? Now, I'm sure there is um, discussion that people would like to, to have on this. Uh, so I, because this is a postponement, we've already taken uh, a lot of uh, comments on this last time. Um, I would ask that if anyone wants to make uh, any further comments today that uh, they uh, be uh, new, uh, considering that we heard all your comments last time, and we've also um, read through all the written materials that were submitted to us. So um, if you have anything to say, uh, if you would keep it to um, only new information or new material, um, as well as uh, per that which is only pertaining to the item at hand, which is 
the uh, validation of the date of the warning as well as the itemization of funds. Those are, that is what this uh, resolution is about. Uh, and um, I don't know, um, uh, Paul Giuliani, it looks like you're like wanting to um, come up and say something. If you if you would like to, um, do you have anything? If you have anything new or additional to add, that is also fine. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council. Uh, after the, uh, for the record, Paul Giuliani representing the city of Montpelier. Uh, you you may want to pull one of the mics towards you. Yeah. After the uh, postponement at the last city council meeting on this, is that better? That's great. Um, uh, city manager contacted me and asked me to uh, analyze the situation, uh, make a conclusion, and render an opinion on the, the law as it applies to uh, this set of facts, which I've done, and I'm glad to share with the, uh, with the council. And I think it's important in this discussion for the council to understand the context in which your deliberations are taking place. Uh, in Vermont, as in e every other state in the United States, there's a strong, almost irrevocable presumption of validity and regularity that attaches to municipal meetings, to the, the vote to electoral action, to votes of, of, uh, on municipal matters, as well as to actions taken by legislative bodies such as yourself. Can I interrupt you for one second? Is, um, are you just going through um, your opinion to us that no, you've already? Oh, no, this is all new. I'm okay. doing, I would like to do is, okay, sorry, is just reiterate or focus on a couple things that were in my memo of March, which I think came up at the last meeting, which I think need a little clarification. Fair enough, thank you. The, the point is that the law in Vermont, as in other jurisdictions, attaches a great deal of significance to the uh, effect and, and the, the, the legal effect of municipal meetings. In Vermont, uh, that expression of interest or concern, if you will, is evidenced by the statutes that are cited in my memo uh, and a very fairly recent uh, Vermont Supreme Court decision involving the city of Montpelier. And what it comes down to is that this presumption of validity and regularity that attaches to municipal meetings uh, is it has with it an extremely high burden of proof, a burden of going forward to either challenge or invalidate or contest in any way the action taken at a municipal meeting. Uh, under our statutes, that contest has to be initiated within 15 days of the vote. Uh, that never occurred with the November meeting on this particular bond election. Nor was there any petition filed seeking reconsideration or rescission of that vote. So we move fast forward to today where the question has come up or issue has come up. There's some irregularities in the not the warning itself for the meeting or the conduct of the meeting. The statute says that certain information needed to be given or imparted prior to the vote. And there was beyond a good faith attempt to comply with that statute, it was an, an immense attempt. But the statute is complicated. The regulations that uh, are under the TIF statute leave a lot to be desired. And there's some question as to whether all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. So and that's a legitimate question, a legitimate concern. But again, the legislature has stepped in and said, here's how you fix the problem. You go back to the city council or the legislative body. You identify where the glitches or to use the Supreme Court's characterization, the irregularities exist, and you pass a validation resolution under one or, or both statutes. And the statutes by their terms validate and confirm and regularize that original election as if these irregularities never occurred. Uh, it's, it's a totally curative statute. Uh, it, there's similar enactments all over the country. I don't pretend to know about them. In Vermont, 
these validation statutes are used with some frequency because things happen. Uh, something slips between the cracks. The statute uses the word inadvertence. Well, people make mistakes, but thank goodness the legislature has seen a way to fix the problem. Now, that is background leads me to my, to my opinion or my conclusion that the city council, this city council, if it feels appropriate to move forward to, 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 to take advantage of the validation statutes, to ratify and confirm what happened at the annual, at the special meeting back in November, in my opinion, you folks are on very, very solid ground to do so. The, the decision is yours, obviously, but if I could leave you with a, a thought, if, is that it's not up to you as a city council to defend or justify what happened in November. The, those actions are presumed valid. If somebody wishes to contest or object, that's, there's a process for that. Whether it's been followed or not, I'm not prepared to answer. But the, the point is that and again, in my opinion, you folks are on very solid ground entertaining this validation resolution and acting on it. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has anything that is new to offer and pertaining to the uh, date uh, adjustment or the itemization of funds, now is the time. Sandy Vitztoom, 14 Loomis Street. Um, new information. Uh, there were two articles published in Vermont Digger after the last discussion publicly on this topic. I wanted to make sure that counselors are aware of that. Um, and the reason why is there are some, several similarities between the St. Albans Project and Montpelier situation. I uh, want to make sure that you're aware of that. The garages are both for about 400 spaces. They lease some portion. Um, Sandy, is this about the date or the itemization of funds? It is. Okay. Uh, the Hampton Inn is a benefiting uh, project immediately adjacent to the garage. The consultant was Burke and White. Uh, the, I, one of my questions, and it is related, is um, what was the process that the city went through when they retained Burke and White? I'm concerned about Burke and White's advising up to the city um, about numerous parts of the TIF plan as well as afterwards any advice they may have given for the warning and getting the project going. Um, was there a bid process? How was Burke and White chosen? Uh, were any other firms actually interviewed? Uh, because uh, St. Albans did consider uh, borrowing to pay down their, their debt. Um, this is important because uh, Bill did clarify that Montpelier is not doing that, but the city did consider doing that, and that was around the time that, that um, taxpayers were told that they would not have to pay for the garage. Um, also, uh, there is this confusion about whether the garage was taxable. Uh, and um, uh, Montpelier has, following Mr. Giuliani's advice, that it is not. Again, that does impact the taxpayers. Um, and thirdly, uh, the, the St. Albans seems to have also had some validation issues as well. So um, th the does, the, does the taxability issue relate to either of those topics? Either the date yes, or because if it is taxed, it affects the pro forma mm -hmm. and the city's having, whether it's going to affect okay. my mill rate. Mm -hmm. um, Sue Print wrote the second article and um, just, she pointed out- so you out, know you're at a little over two minutes. So the, um, the she points out that um, the St. Albans voters had little chance but to rely on the guidance of their paid city managers and other professionals um, that they could not be expected to understand how the TIF statute works or the repayment terms. Um, I really do hope the counselors take time to understand this if they haven't already read this. I'm um, submitting this information, I guess, to, Great. Thank you. to John Odom. 
Thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, I want to caution again. The the council appears to be doubling down. If if there's somewhat of an acknowledgement, it sounds like Giuliani is admitting mistakes were made, and rather than let these appeals play out. We're going to double down and try to barrel through, which is what I warned you about before the vote was ever taken, that, in effect, you're further dividing the community, you know? And there was a quote in one of the articles referenced in Digger that, and I'm sure it was in a bit of peak, but if these decisions are vulnerable to appeals and actions by parties that don't have proper standing, it's really not for our city staff to be deciding who has standing and who doesn't here. Uh, so I think we've got this, uh, I think so we need to- Stephen, this should uh, pertain to um, uh, either the date or the itemization of funds. Okay, any further comments? All right, so if there's no further comments, uh, I'll, we have a motion in a second uh, to, uh, about this validation resolution. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the motion passes, um, and uh, we are gonna move on, thank you. Okay, so the alternative transportation fund budget. Uh, I am pretty excited to talk about that. Um, so, I'm sure there are, uh, oh yep, so uh, Corey is here, awesome, welcome. Um, so we had circulated the proposed multi-year spending plan for the alternative transportation funds uh, with a brief description of, of everything listed. Uh, I wasn't gonna go through line by line. Um, I did just wanna give a brief overview um, in the past these funds have been, um, committees really tried to utilize um, both other matching grant funds and um, opportunities where other projects are happening um, to kind of further the Montpelier motion plan. And uh, I think they've, they've put together um, a plan here that does that. Um, I know there's some items that they had gone kind of back and forth on. Um, but, uh, you know, all in all, I think it's a pretty responsible responsible plan. Um, you know, one other focus point is uh, when it comes to planning studies and implementing those planning studies, and not just planning studies, but um, other things like the traffic calming policy that, that's being developed. It's not just about um, funding the development of those plans and, and programs. It's making sure something is there at the end to help implement it. Um, I, I think that's, a, that's been a focus of theirs. Um, you know, I, discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Questions, uh, Jack? Not a question, but a comment. I was at the uh, Transportation Committee meeting at which this was developed, and I can uh, confirm that people, members of the committee, really went through this line by line, uh, made, made choices for what made sense, what didn't made, make sense, what uh, items we, or expenditures we could defer in, in order to get to the things that we really wanted to do. Um, we did some uh, changing around of uh, sidewalk gap uh, planning, for instance. And the, the question I had was whether, uh, how the city would accommodate the issue of not d devoting as much money to some of the planning as uh, as had been requested, I understand from the uh, comments tonight that the city can live with it and find the money uh, elsewhere for their planning. And so I think we should just 
adopt this budget? Kevin, do you have something to add? I do. Um, so <laughs> the planning department had requested um, uh, approximately $44,750 from the Alternative Transportation Fund for the uh, downtown uh, master plan as a part of the um, a number of pieces uh, as part of the Rialto Street, Street Bridge, which we got a $23,000 grant for. Um, we've got $6,000 to do stormwater modeling. Um, we need that additional money to pay for that contract. Um, and that request was was under the, the, the guise that this type of kind of comprehensive downtown planning is ideally suited for this type of thing. We are looking at, um, you know, bike and pe pedestrian issues and how they, co they conflict, how we want to use that space downtown, where we're going to put city benches, how we incorporate the planning that has been done before, like the main Berry Street scoping study. And this is the key piece to get implementation funds. So we're going to be looking at stormwater, and um, we're going to be looking at those other pieces. Um, so I understand that the committee did good work. Um, and if there is another source of funding, it's fantastic. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there is that um, I do believe that this would be an appropriate use of these funds. Um, uh, Donna, uh, I missed the meeting. That in June, but in May when we talked about it, we had a compromise with around 30000 for the streetscape master plan. So what happened last Tuesday that we lost $20,000 on that line item? I, I think the main thing was um, when we had taken that straw poll, we weren't really looking, or the committee really wasn't looking at the hard numbers at the time. I think it was more of a, yeah, we want to fund this to a point and then when they started looking at potential projects that uh, other projects that could be funded um, it, it started to go down and down <laughs> yeah I'm disappointed yeah. I must say I'm disappointed I, I think it's competition between planning money and expenditures on concrete uh, measures that are ready to be implemented right now and out over the next three years. So there we are. Yeah, I am just psyched to have a plan for this money over the next three years, um, you know, after not, not really having a plan for. Um, we, we gave you a five year plan. Oh, fair enough. And then a three year plan. We went five years, then three, I and then forgot. So I'm sorry. We've had no, a you're good. Yeah. budget. No, you're, you're good. And every we year, come back every I year. I have forgotten. And every <laughs> year we have unspent money. And, and so I was really for the streetscape so that we could have something that we could implement with our future money. So I'm not familiar, I'm afraid to say, where the other money's coming from for the master plan. Do we have any idea? You said you understood that was solved? Yeah. Like. I, I, I don't have any idea. What I meant by that was that I, I wouldn't have been surprised if the city staff had come to us. You know, we've got a recommendation to... Uh, approve the budget, um, I wouldn't have been surprised if the recommendation had been, don't do what the committee said, but in fact, uh, re realign the budget to provide more to the streetscape master plan. Um, so that, well, we don't that's where I try to undermine our committees that way. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. No, and I don't think it would have been, um, I, I don't think they would have been surprised either. Yeah. Because um, they know this item is out there, and, and they understand the importance of it. And I just wanted to put out there, too, is that I think that, you know, one of the pieces that comes through this um, is that with this comprehensive downtown plan, this is going to be the piece that gives us leverage to additional pieces. So one of the pieces that we're doing that was an add-on is um, a stormwater modeling piece. So when we look at what the options are, um, we can say, okay, um, if we install... 18 rain gardens along the street, it will reduce the total impacts on the river by X. When we have those those numbers, when we go to apply for like an ERP grant, um, you know, they're gonna say, okay, we have a, a concrete number that we can look at. Um, so I would just kind of encourage the council and not necessarily against the committee, but um, you know, to, to look at this and say that, that you know, it, it's gotta come from somewhere. So um, it is an expense. Uh, and whether or not you want to take it from this or somewhere else. Um. Uh, Glenn. Um, thanks. I, sure. I, I think I was at the May meeting too, and then I haven't been since then. I guess I'm curious to hear 
because I think that the streetscape master plan is a, a really strong priority for me, certainly, and I, I love all the things that we're planning to do with this money as laid out in the proposal here, but can, can you speak more specifically about what the streetscape master plan can do for now with $10,000 and where we might look beyond We that could really call the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so no. If, if, if we... If we go ahead with this, then the streetscape master plan is basically tabled for now. No. 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 Yeah. We have a contract. We, we, we just have to find the money somewhere else. Yes. We have to find the money. Whether it comes from here or somewhere else, the money okay. is going to be spent. So then, and maybe this question is premature, but uh, Bill, uh, <laughs> <laughs> any ideas about where that money might come from if not from... Yeah. Off the top of my head, okay. no, but we'll be reviewing it tomorrow morning. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Don. Well, I mean, I'm looking at this, you know, and, it's, and as much time as we've spent on the covered bike parking, there really isn't a lot of support for it, and 5500 is not going to cover it. That's just the material. It's no labor to install it. So I'm looking there and saying, why can't we use that piece? And then there's the one on, is it... Um, one of some of the sidewalks that weren't there before. And is Main Street Barry taking the full 50, Corey? Um, that's, that's the estimate that's in the report right now, yes. I don't have any further numbers than that, but that as is far, I thought this was gonna, the estimate's gonna get closer as we're getting almost to the end of it. Um, no, that's, okay. no, that'll be the number at the end of this. They won't change that number much, if at all. Oh, okay. Um, my uh, inclination here is to leave this as is, unless others have ideas as to how we, uh, specifics as to how we want to change it. But before we consider that, um, comes from the public. Peter Lux Montpelier. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be an observer at the budget meeting. And I want to thank the committee members for their hard work. They were very diligent and responsible to put together the budget. Um, the thing that concerned me a little bit during the meeting was that it seemed that not all the committee members were fully informed on how the pieces connect together. And I know the city is doing really amazing and awesome work on strategic planning, master planning, and what the priorities should be for the city. Um, and I didn't hear the decisions really roll up to those priorities necessarily or the principles that the city is trying to put forward. Um, and so I, my heart did go out to the committee members who had to decide whether or not they have two or three beacons to keep pedestrians safe or put a sidewalk here to keep people safe. Uh, and so the, the fundamental issue is that maybe their budget isn't big enough. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think uh, also it should be a primary um, principle to look at whether the line items help people drive less. And I think in this discussion, someone needs to uh, say the word climate change, because this is really what people in this community care about is that we want people to drive less. And there was one particular line item that I was, it's not a bad line item, a sidewalk on Hubbard, but it does not get people out of their cars. It does not fundamentally change whether or not people can walk there or bike there. There is a sidewalk on one side. Um, so I wonder why that one went in and other items don't make it. Uh, and as you know, I'm looking for a place to live Murray Hill condos are out because I want to be able to walk to town. I cannot walk from there. Um, Berlin Street is questionable. There's a lot of other places. And so this is also a housing issue, partially. Um, and um, there is a housing shortage in town. And I talk to more and more people who are actually moving to Barrie. So what are we doing to make the connection to Barrie better uh, in terms of bike paths or other connections like that? So. I don't want to negotiate the budget here, but I do think that it's important for committees to have the full picture 
And when organizations typically decide on priorities, they have a list. And that list will say why it's a priority, how it fits into the bigger planning, and then there's like a line. And what makes it above the line and below the line is decided on the current priorities of the city. And one of the changes since the Montpelier motion um, plan is that we will now have a bike path to more or less the roundabout at 302. So that could connect to Sherwood Drive, for example. Uh, so those kind of discussions, I think, should be part of the budget planning, and I didn't feel that that was actually the case. Well, thank you for um, raising the issue of climate change in this, uh, the context of uh, this conversation. That's absolutely important and, uh, in part, what motivated this money in the first place. Uh, Jack. Um, I'll show you how you could walk to walk down to the city from Murray Hill <laughs> and go right through my yard. <laughs> um, but uh, the Hubbard Street sidewalk, the, the proposal as it came to us was to put the money into uh, the College Street uh, gap where there's sidewalk on only one side. And we decided to put the money onto Hubbard Street instead because that's where kids at Union School might be using the, si using the sidewalk. And that seemed like we would contribute more toward pedestrian safety than doing College Street at this point. You'll notice, Donna, that this plan over the next three years really spends up almost all the money, which- Oh yeah, we budgeted we're, we're, every year. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so right now, we're entering fiscal 20 with a $128,000 carry forward if this gets sp spent the way it's anticipated, we're, we're going to be not at zero, but close to zero for a couple of years. Yeah, the, the budgets always show expenditures. We just don't end up spending. Oh, OK. Just uh, another addition to the Harvard Street sidewalk. That was another um, opportunistic uh, item with work taking place. Um, on that street next year. It's scheduled to be resurfaced. Um, there is a retaining wall along there that um, is going to be rebuilt. So um, that was a coordination effort with ongoing city project. But it, it, was, a, it was a topic, um, you know, uh, just what Peter said was there is sidewalk on the other side of the street, and how do we um, prioritize those, those situations? Um, so yes, it was that those same points were brought up uh, when going over this. What year is the, is the Hubbard Street sidewalk planned for? This year. This year. Next year. Next year. Next year. Uh, Glenn. Um, thanks. I'm glad to hear about the Hubbard Street, Street thing. I also wanted to recall uh, Tom McArdle said earlier this evening that there is a plan to extend the sidewalk on Berlin Street, I believe, out to Sherwood Drive. Um, and the thing I missed in that comment was was when that might happen or how far out that might be. Do we have a uh, an idea how long out that is? Yeah, we um, last year we applied um, for a grant to construct that sidewalk. Um, we didn't get it, so now we're on to uh, kind of Plan B, and um, it's a it, it's a multi-year in-house project. Um, it is a pretty long distance. So I don't think our crews would be able to complete it over one year. It may, may take a couple of years, but that is the plan to do it in-house. So basically starting something like the next fiscal year, if we can get the grant and extending more than one year before it's completed, is that? Um, no, the grant is no longer. Oh, I uh, see. It, it's just in-house it. force okay. account work. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. I understand. OK. Any further public comment? Okay, um, is there a motion regarding um, the multi-year budget for the Alternative Transportation Fund? I move we adopt it as proposed. A second. Further discussion? Okay, um, <laughs> all right, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. You're gonna have to vote. I am gonna vote aye. <laughs> I don't often get to vote. Oh, there we go. Right. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I knew you would. Yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all good. Um, all right, so the motion carries. Uh, and uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Okay, so the winter operations uh, debrief. Uh, also, I just want to make a note, it is 9 o'clock. Uh, I anticipate that we may not, I don't know, it depends on if the, the ordinance items are fast but, and, or, or we jettison them. Do you want to get a weather report on that now? Yeah. I, what, fast. I think it could be fast. I, th I think both of them are fast based on my review. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. We're I'll not going to jettison them then. We don't have our <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Welcome. Again. <laughs> It will be a lot faster than this winter seemed. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Uh, this is Brian Tuttle, our superintendent, and Tom McCardle. Um, don't see an awful lot of Brian, so he's usually out leading the charge for our work out in the field. Um, so good to have him. Um, so the, the reason for this um, debrief, I believe I did one last year as well, um, is the uh, significance of the winter um, and the impacts that we all saw and felt um, that while we're out doing the work um, everybody's seeing it and feeling it so it was a it was a wanted to remember try to forget kind of winter um, it was a challenging one um, ice snow freeze thaw um, you've read the report so I won't go over all the details um, is that the city has its topographical and development patterns that lead to a lot of the the difficulty in managing it. Um, I think overall um, we did a, a, a good job under the circumstances, and I'm proud of our crew for for hanging in there with us and long nights and and um, weekends and holidays. Um, and uh, but looking at these, these, these this type of uh, uh, these types of challenges, um, not terribly unusual. Um, night like to see less rain following storms. Um, but it's a it's a learning experience, and we try to try to reflect on that. Um, what went well, what didn't. Um, even talk to Barry City how how they um, did their work. We were getting some comparisons um, with us, and when I spoke spoke with them, uh, with their public works director, he said, "Well, I've been hearing that Montpelier is doing a better job than we are." So it's all in the in the perspectives we have and in the streets we live on, um, what people are seeing. I love um, that comment in your report. Sorry to interrupt. About uh, you know people in Barrie are getting the comment that Montpelier is doing it better. Uh, that's not that what I heard. Just, so. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Montpelier is doing it better. Barrie's better. Barrie's is Montpelier. Anyway, just good there. good uh, perspective. Yeah, I there, think right? so. Yeah, that's that was that was a uh, that was helpful speaking with yeah, him yeah. about that. Um, somebody suggested I do that, and I I thought it was a good idea. So appreciate that. Um, so I'll talk about that a little more. Um, the the uh, things that we've learned and the changes that we're considering um, is is how we address the snowbank removal. How frequently do we wait till the next storm comes in? Uh, we got kind of caught on that decision um, when it, that snowbank then became ice. Um, so is that something that we can we can manage? It's a personnel. It's a staffing issue. As I mentioned, we don't own the trucks that that. We need to keep that snowblower busy. So if we put our little trucks out there, where there's a lot of downtime, so we usually rent trucks. And Barry City has one or two, I believe. Two. So, um, so that's a difference. Um, we lease or purchase a, a one of ten wheeler for the season, and then we get into a season where we have very little snow. Does that does that make sense? So, um, some things we have to look at and consider before we get into the next winter. Um, because the rentals can be unreliable and then there's heavy demand for them uh, when we call and they're not available. Um, we've talked about shift changes with our union. That's not a popular thing, but it's uh, something we have to, to look at. I'm not sure whether that's going to go anywhere, but again, it's a learning experience looking back at this. Um, another one is the, the winter parking ban, and I think that's the one of the Big focuses and, and certainly a change in difference with Barry City um, that has a full season uh, uh, parking ban, um, on street parking ban. That has been challenging. Um, we absolutely recognize um, and appreciate the beneficial aspects of it um, and are here to support 
um, our community and do whatever we can to support these policy decisions. But it's also important that you know that there are um, trade-offs, as I trade-offs, as I mentioned, um, and that there's a that's a um, you know way, matter of weighing priorities. Um, when we can't plow to the street to the curb at will, um, and those snow banks get bigger, we have uh, we do have to plan for snow bank removal rather than let's do it tonight. We've got a good crew. Um, we're rested. Let's move forward. We got a storm coming in and. So there are things that we need to do um, to respond to that, changes that we've made ever since it was implemented in 2014-15 winter. Um, one thing we know must improve is we must achieve a better voluntary compliance. Um, the thing that we've, we're struggling with right now is, is our towing company um, exceeded their capacity, ability to, to to remove vehicles and now we're having to plow around them and we have one towing company left um, to work with and uh, trying to we met with them um, and trying to come up with a with a plan to, to keep them here working for us so that we don't have to buy a, a, a tow truck um, so to improve that is what can we do to improve compliance um, this is often uh, the case um, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, we are, um, there's the complaints, um, challenging appeals are mostly heard by the manager's office um, and the police department. Um, so those are, those are difficult uh, to try to, try to, um, try to work through and explain. And, and so what, what, needs to be done. Uh, one thing we'd like to come back with is is increasing fines, not to make money, but to get the word out. If there's people that are maybe gaming the system, um, you know, maybe I get towed four or five times a year, um, it's less expensive than finding alternative off-street parking. I don't know what the situation is, um, but whatever the case is, we need this, the vehicles off the street. Um, Tom, for this plan to us, work. Could you give us the towing numbers in here? I didn't see them. I, but I may have just read it too. I believe fast. they are in the statistics. So okay, I'll relook yeah, re at They're them. in there. But yeah. I thought they had slowed down. Maybe it was just a. Depends. First I mean, some people, a lot of people do their own evaluation, maybe, of, uh, well, it's going to storm tonight, um, and so I probably ought to move the, the vehicle. But if we're doing cleanup um, or snowbank removal, um, they're, I, I'm speculating only um, that they are assuming that we don't need the, the parking ban. I'm not sure um, huh? how that works, but, but the numbers are good for, for a predicted storm and much less later. So okay. maybe we should extend that, that parking ban time period till we get full cleanup completed, um, snow bags removed, it's another, another option. Um, reducing the areas the snow ban actually is in effect. Where do we really need it in town? Where is parking demand, the, the uh, op for off street, um, uh, the, the capacity doesn't exist? Um, because we have to provide an alternative parking location. Um, our hope is uh, if the garage moves forward, that would be a great place for alternative overnight parking. Um, in the meanwhile, we have to use these two lots and stone cutters, and that's been a challenge because we do have to plow them eventually. Um, and Tom, uh, do the uh, the parking fines or the towing fines at least cover the cost of uh, each tow? So there's the the fine um, for on street parking. That's the uh, for being on the street when the events. Um, Whether they're towed or not. Towed, and then there's the towing fee is a separate charge. So it's, they're not combined. So if that vehicle is physically actually towed, then they have to pay the towing company. Okay, thank you. Uh, but people sometimes get tickets and not towed because the towing company just doesn't get to them in time. Another another strategy we use is just just the ticket the fine only if we're doing s snow bank removal in a certain part of town. We really have to put the whole ban in effect um, because we have no other means of, of doing that. So those vehicles won't get towed, but they'll just get the fine. Um, some other ideas that we're, we're looking at um, is um, the expenditure part of this possibility is the 
uh, additional uh, message board signs and maybe some remote uh, beacons, uh, lights that are on. Plattsburgh, New York has that. Light is on, the parking ban's in effect. Again, the idea is to gain compliance. Um, um, does Burlington have those too? Burlington has, uh, you're familiar yeah. most with Burlington. Yeah, when the lights are on, the cars are gone, yeah. yeah. And just to check in on that, because I saw that too, um, <laughs> it's the, the request is to do something like six beacons, and it says 7,000. Is that for all six, or is that per each? I wasn't clear. Um, I don't recall. I actually wrote this report some time ago, so it's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Is that price for each? Is that price for each? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay, I'm not, that's okay. Not positive. So this is an actual expenditure request right now. Sure. We're, um, so we're, we're looking at so kind of a follow-up to this. And, and, I mean, and well, and you, Tom, will have retired by time <laughs> by the time we are making our our we're next budget. Now. And so we'll, I, I suppose this is obvious, uh, but you know, one would assume that, that whoever uh, steps in will have this information and be able to budget accordingly. Yeah, so they'll uh, work with whoever the successor is with, uh, with the file and, and a thick file on our winter parking van um, that I've accumulated and other things, so yes, that's true. You'll that's be around to consult. So. I would really like to have this house in order um, by the time I leave. I don't want to leave, you know, problems or issues with a, for the next person. So yeah. to the extent that we can come up with a, a plan, um, it's that much less stressful for the for the next guy. And and something that works for the community is really what this is all about, what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And to do our job as well. Yep. So it's a balance. Hey, Mr. Retirement Day? I'm sorry? Uh, City Manager's Weekly Report like two weeks ago or so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm gone. It's okay. Uh, yeah. I know, I haven't met you. There was an announcement. Yeah, so you retired. I know. Shoot. Right? You could pass an ordinance preventing it. <laughs> <laughs> I said they could pass an ordinance preventing it. Preventing your retirement. <laughs> Probably Sorry. require a charge. No, I have trouble <laughs> enforcing that one. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, so a, well, a speed um, study on your... Uh, trying to get these things off my bucket list for you. So are you one of those retirees we can get back part-time? I, I will I will make myself as available as, as much as necessary. But not, uh, no. uh, well, thank you for uh, putting this together. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Glenn, yeah. I had just uh, one other thing to mention. Um, Peter Lux beat me to uh, be the first person in the meeting to talk about climate change, I think. But uh, this discussion, this report, which is great, and thank you very much for it, uh, immediately reminded me of going to see Roger Hill talk a couple of weeks ago at the Unitarian Church and um, I learned a lot of stuff there among which uh, learned that uh, his prediction is that we're going to get more long spells of uh, precipitation over weeks and months sort of like we saw this past winter uh, more and more often over the coming 20, 30, 80 years. Um, and given that, it was very convincing. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to watch it too, just because it's a lot of cool stuff about uh, the, the temperature gradient from the equator to the pole and why that takes energy out of the, the uh, circumpolar uh, cycle, which makes it less like a fast, straight river and more like oxbows which is where the standing fronts come in and why we get just rain forever and then drought forever because it's just standing there like an oxbow. Anyway, given all that, I wonder whether uh, you think we might consider more dramatic changes to our policy or, or plans in terms of um, staffing or, or how we operate. We may get a winter like this every year for a long time. Um, do we currently have the capacity to handle that every year? Um, well, I guess I was trying to be kind, but um, not really get to that. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I think if 
Um, it, it, you know, the, the word uh, retire is the operative part of that is tired. Um, and this, this is significantly very, very tiring in this position. And, and that kind of winter um, can, is really draining. Um, the, the staffing level, I, it, it remains to be seen whether or not that's sustainable with what we have today if this were to actually continue. And, and I wish I'd seen that. But Roger does our um, actual does our, our weekly reports or our actual updates of local yeah. um, contracting, and I think that would be um, a significant uh, impact on uh, you know, just the, the burnout rate of, of personnel, um, but equipment, our budgets, our, our um, and just the, the impact on everybody's lives on what that means. That there's nothing worse than rain in the winter. Um, everything freezes. We can't get on top of it quickly enough. We can't de-ice it, um, and then it just freezes over again. And it's it, you haven't done anything on my street yet or sidewalk, um, and that's 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 tough to take. Um, and I hope it's not true, but but we do have to be prepared for those types of possibilities and eventualities. Um, I, you know, this winter parking ban event uh, event base program made a great deal of sense. We went two, three, four weeks without any precipitation that was plowable. And yet we were requiring people to not park on the street. So it's, it's uh, if we're in that type of uh, season from a winter plowing or management perspective, it's not workable. If this were to continue, this is the norm, the new norm. Um, I would I would suggest or hope or think that, that we would have to bring that to the city council's attention and say, the city manager needs to really implement the the winter parking ban event for the rest of the winter. Um, if we can't get the snow banks cleared, the sidewalks don't drain. The sidewalks don't drain. People are tripping and falling, and uh, so or you can't get from your car into the sidewalk. That's that's just not acceptable from from our perspective. That's not the operational standard we want to. Right. right. I think that. Um, this year we had 11 rain events, which I've never seen before. I've been doing this for 36 years, and I've never seen that many rainstorms in the winter. Um, before I think the year before that was five, which I thought was a lot. So Roger, pro Roger probably has a point that you know this. This maybe it'll get worse. And uh, um, from from my perspective, um, you know I. I wonder if our staffing levels are going to be adequate. If this is if this is going to be the normal winter, we we we. I was wondering when people were going to mutiny this year. Mm -hmm. It was it was that bad. People were just burnt out and worn out when they weren't getting enough sleep. And um, so, um, if this is going to be the normal winter, somewhere down the line, something has to change. So, and the parking ban is part of it, but I think staffing is another part of it. And I was using water sewer people. I was using mechanics. And, and everybody was tired. I mean, absolutely everybody just would, wanted it to be over and it just seemed like it never ended. So, um, <clears throat> Thanks, know. Roger, for bringing that <laughs> great information yeah. to us. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it needs to be brought up, I think. Yeah. And, well, at least um, he confirmed why you were tired. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got one coming. more winner in me. That's it, yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's, it, it seems like there's no level of, um, just appreciation that can, you know, overcome that that level of tired. You know what I mean? Like we we all were so very grateful, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, but you're I totally hear you that you know if this is normal, we we just need more people. Yeah. Um, to to handle that. Um, right. Yeah. And, no, and it's it's points. operational changes as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You, do, you make adjustments, yeah. I think too. Yeah. So yeah. I think you'll see the different. whole industry will will start addressing this, you know, as, um, you know, we went, both Tom and I went to two snow conferences, national snow conferences, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure if you went this year, you would find that people are finding ways to adapt to this, and, yeah. and how do we do this, and, and I don't have the answer, <clears throat> but I would assume that everybody's looking at it. Yeah, it's helpful to network, uh, as we're not in yeah. this alone, it's, it's a gain a lot from those conferences and talking with their colleagues, so. Um, what people are doing, how they're or innovating, and, and um, so maybe equipment changes. Um, you know, about a different different sidewalk plow that was kind of cool, mm -hmm. um, and you know, maybe have our own 
own trucks and um, for hauling snow. So where we used to just rent them four times a year, now it's we need them about every week. Um, so it's uh, and then try to get it out before it turns to ice, which is another whole other matter. So yeah, and Brian sends me stuff about this ice breaking machine that goes down the. So yeah, I did. <laughs> I never got a response, but anyway. Well, thank you so much Smashing. for um, putting this all together and uh, for all of your, your work this year and through this tough winter. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we'll look for uh, you know, some of these uh, suggestions to be implemented potentially for next winter. That's good. So. Yeah, I think definitely, uh, you know, the, the big, if you have one takeaway from this, other than appreciating what DBW does, it's the winter parking ban. I mean, it's definitely... You know, as Tom mentioned, um, we're down to one towing company, and they're balking. I mean, it's because they're getting tired too. They're out pulling these all night, mm -hmm. and if, if if we can't tow, we don't have a ban. Yeah. Um, and yet, it was implemented to help make downtown housing more feasible and all of that. So it's uh, it's it's certainly when we get a lot of complaints in the winter about oh the roads aren't clean, and you look and you see you know cars yeah. didn't move they had to work around cars and they get those big vehicles down some of the streets because the snow started too late to call a ban and uh, it's it's tricky yeah so well and i guess i want to make sure that we as a council are still open to hearing you know if the if the suggestion from dpw were this this arrangement of the parking ban is no longer working it's no longer functional the, that's that would be a really important message um, for us. That's not necessarily what I'm hearing at this point, but it uh, sounds like you know that is a real possibility um, for the future. So I, anyway, I just want to make sure that that we're all uh, at least aware that that could be the message. Well, point. you know, the, the f social media is out there. I think that's 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 truly beneficial if we if we use it that way. Talk to our neighbors. Um, if you have a visitor in town that's that's here and doesn't isn't aware of what this event base is, um, you see a neighbor's car out in the street, let them know. Uh, work with us on this. It's not all about us just making these these uh, calls. Um, we rely on eyes on the street to tell us if there's a problem, and we would really find it helpful if both people would help their neighbors um, and get those cars moved. Um, you know, put it in my driveway, kind of a neighborly gesture, would help us a lot way, help, help them. So it's a, it's a two-way street. If we look at it that way, as challenging as the winter can be, we can all do this together. Um, yep. But it's not always a two-way street if the cars don't move. <laughs> Especially when it gets down to one lane. <laughs> That's right. That's a great okay. point. You know, That's great. what we can do for ourselves. Well, thank you again. And so I don't think we need to take any action on this at this point. So. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Up to uh, the uh, ordinance uh, amendments. Um, so this is uh, uh, the second time we are reviewing uh, Chapter 2. And I just want to uh, sorry, get to this item here a second. I'm assuming this is a public hearing. Yes. So I'm going to open the public hearing um, on the proposed <laughs> on the proposed uh, amendments to Chapter Two of the Code of Ordinances. Um, any comments from the public or the council? I'm happy with them the way they are. Okay. And no comments from the public. So I'm going to close the public hearing on. Chapter two. Any further comments from council? No, I feel good, pretty good about it as well. I move um, chapter two. Second. Further discussion. Um, all. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. On to chapter three. Uh, so I am going to open the public hearing on the first reading. Oh, uh, wait a minute. This says. Third reading, I think it means. This is the first one. First, yeah, yeah, this is the first reading of yeah. Chapter Three. Um, so yeah, opening public hearing. Uh, any comments on Chapter Three? I didn't see anything I wanted to change. Good. I have a few things. Um, 
some of them are maybe questions. Uh, in section 3-305I, um, which is about, uh, well, there's a sentence in there that says, the city council may reduce or waive at its discretion the connection charge for non-residential connections. Um, uh, and I wonder whether it would be worth considering giving ourselves the uh, the ability to reduce or waive connection charge for residential connections. It feels like we have some movement toward uh, ADUs, for example, and um, if we want to encourage that, we might want to have the option to reduce or waive. Um, I'd be curious to hear if anyone has an opinion on that, or we can just follow up next time. Well, it'd be, yeah, why don't we get some feedback on that, because yeah. I, I think um, I'm not sure why. I, you know, I'm assuming that the the waiver for commercial was as part of some kind of you know trying to get a company to come here or something. Yeah, uh, an economic development yeah. thing. Whereas, you know, probably at, and this is an old ordinance that they probably didn't want you know every single new homeowner trotting in saying, can, can you waive my? I would I would not want to have that be the uh, right. So the, the result. Uh, maybe there's some kind of. I do, I do know we've had complaints in the past when people have added units in their house, kind of what you're talking about, um, and they've already got a connection, and now they're adding a you know a second apartment. You know, the, the other side of that is well, now there's new, you know, there's more impact on the water system, and so you're basically buying into an investment that people who paid for the water treatment plant and all the lines made, and you're becoming a stockholder, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, Donna? I oh, just I'm wondered sorry. if the non-residential connection had more parts to it and the residential was more straightforward. No? Don't know. Okay. Um, the, yeah. the, the other uh, speculation I want to, to uh, put out on that is makes sense. Uh, when you have a new connection, you're buying in and so on. I, I wouldn't want to forego the option to, to uh, get that um, fee. I also was thinking reading this that, that I think we heard here uh, a couple of meetings back that um, many of the houses, the older houses in Montpelier had an average occupancy of, you know, or uh, normal family was something like 16 people uh, back when, and now it's two, you know, in these big old houses. So transforming some of those uh, old houses with ADUs or something, yes, you're, you're going from two people to, to three or four or five, but I would think that at least in some cases, you're still not even coming close to the original capacity of that house. So I think it'd be worth following up anyway. Um, I'm having trouble pulling up the actual ordinances, so so I'm I'm looking at my what, email. What notes. section was that again, Glenn? I just want to make sure I flag. I think I think I've got it. I'm sorry. What Which section? section? That was three dash three o five, section I. Five. Page six. Yeah. Um, and then three dash four o five, section C, four. I just want to say out loud. Um, that I think uh, I think this was about preventing going into the sewer system. Various things, including whole blood, paunch, manure, hair, and fleshings, uh, which is a wonderful little array of things. And and it seems to me like we we, I mean, in in some ways I'd love to keep that in there just for the the, the sake of it. <laughs> it also feels like we could uh, cut it off early in that section and say something. I think it's something like. Anything under, anything over half an inch is not allowed. Um, and again, I might have to get back to the specific ordinance. Anyway, that had to say it uh, in the public meeting. Um, section three dash four one two about um, the sewer benefit charge. Um, that language change is a little bit confusing to me. It looks like the, the original language was the city council determines 
that it's a benefit and and so on and therefore determines that we will charge for it and and the new language is something like the city council may determine um, my my impression is that we've already that city council did determine and I'm not sure why we would have to redetermine so it just is confusing I'm still having trouble finding sorry three so dash three four dash one. four one two it's the, the new three dash four one two right yes. sewer separation benefit charge sewer separation benefit charge that's right yes. so uh, if if it goes from city council determines uh, that separation uh, well let me back up if it's not the city council who's determining it I'm, I don't know who would determine it um, it's an interesting question yeah I guess it just it, uh, I, I'm not sure why it's phrased honestly I'm not sure it's for why it's phrased either of those ways it feels to me like it should be something more like um, it's a benefit and we charge for it uh, hmm. anyway again we don't need to, to determine it now but I think it may need some follow up Yeah, I don't know why we put that in. Someone added that. Um, I'm not sure who I'll add a question mark in that. We may not need that. Okay. And then the last thing, which is just uh, for my own enjoyment, indulge me for a moment, uh, I want to fess up that I am in violation, I believe, of section-3, section 3-510. No person shall in any manner change any natural water course on private <laughs> property without first obtaining permission from the public works director. There was a beautiful little trickle of water on our backyard, and I dug a hole and put a bathtub in it, and it is a joy and a pleasure uh, in the summer. And I will ask, I will ask <laughs> for forgiveness from, from Tom before he retires. Um, and I, I mean, a little bit more seriously, that, that seems potentially um, uh, overreaching maybe it seems like a, a, a pretty heavy burden if if anyone doing anything to a little trickle of water on their land has to ask public works first I actually disagree yeah. um, how do you measure that well and I, I well, recall I really apologize sorry no it's okay uh, uh, I recall conversations um, with Jessica Edgerly Walsh on the council, um, who lived on lives on Blackwell Street, where um, diverting drainage uh, was a huge problem, um, and that if you uh, if you divert it uh, on your own property that has unknown consequences, yeah, unknown, potentially else. unknown, but serious consequences for people downhill, um, that it might go into their foundation or et cetera. It's um, can be cumulative. I too. stand corrected. That it's okay. makes perfect sense. Yeah, no worries. We're Not still sure. getting emails from uh, someone <laughs> regarding the yes. Scribner Street uh, yeah. situation. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one thing from Lauren. Actually, um, she could not be here. Sorry, to, if, unless you're not done. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, so Lauren, um, I have not. Um, uh, found this in, in my you know scrolling through but she says uh, I wanted to note that I was interested in looking into possibly updating the language in section 3-405 C2 so I'll like, give you a second to get there 3-405 C2 that's the use of public sewers Okay, so she says, in particular, to provide greater clarity on defining toxic or poisonous substances, perhaps referencing state or federal hazardous waste lists or statutes to ensure that we are robustly protecting our waters from toxic contamination. Any, for, any comments from the public? Chapter three. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna close the public hearing on chapter three. We have some things to look into on that, and I th think we need to vote on the second reading um, for chapter three. I move we schedule second reading for chapter three for uh, our meeting on June 26th. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's 9.30 and we are at outcomes and work plan.
Shall so, I turn it over to you? Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, this um, this is taking, you've seen some of the outlines of this before, but basically taking the strategic plan work that you, you'd approve the, the content of it a, couple, a meeting or two ago and simply calendaring this. And you have a draft of the calendar actually on your desks as well. And we've been included in the weekly memo. But if there are, if you don't like this or you want to make changes to the sequencing, we just tried our best to figure out when the best times might be and how much time we were going to need to prepare for something and what, what topics might go with other topics on a certain night uh, so that we could group staff and those kinds of things. One thing that isn't explicitly mentioned on this list, I just noticed tonight, but the, you know, we are planning to have a committee report to on most of these meetings as you had the conservation committee tonight. That was the, our request. So this is basically trying to take your plan and put it into action. Uh, Connor. Yeah, just one note. Um, I, I, I sort of considered the livable wage and uh, socially responsible contracting ordinances, two separate ordinances, one being sort of the narrow scope of construction projects over $200,000. So mm -hmm. just wanted to make sure that was uh, everybody else's feeling. It's Liberal wage seems like a different animal, but, but I could see how they would be connected. If right. I think the idea was to have them the same night. Okay. That was so. You're right. I can split that so it's clearer. But. Um, I had a question uh, about uh, under uh, environmental stewardship. Uh, building Confluence Park is scheduled for July 2019. Um, right, it's listed right after a complete a riverfront master plan. Um, just in thinking through the process with the Vermont River Conservancy, I mean, the confluence, I mean, they're, they're doing all kinds of, um, you know, visioning of, like, what that can look like, and my assumption in when, when you say here, build Confluence Park, that's just the, the first iteration and that it may be um, revised. Right, and okay. in fact, we, if you, if you look at this, the actual calendar, we have it, after you and I met with Ricarda, we actually moved that to September. Oh, okay, so, so it's on the calendar for September. That's okay. when they're going to provide us the update of the plans, and great. we'll select. I was date. feeling like that was fast. So okay, great. Yes, glad to hear that. Sure. Um, you know, I I'm <laughs> very interested in the stormwater master plan. I saw um, that uh, implementation of the stormwater master plan re recommendations again under um, environmental stewardship uh, is listed as ongoing, um, and I. Uh, Ongoing is fine, uh, but I would also love to just have a, uh, a report, you know, like where are we at, how, you know, in it, I don't know if it's possible for it to ha be like a, a no pressure kind of situation because like, I just want to know, right. <laughs> you know, like I, I just want to know where we're at and that, that's just helpful and informative. Um, but having some kind of a uh, check in as to where, where we are and, uh, you know, in part the ongoing um, the the deadlines that say ongoing, you know, again is is in part fine, but um, just having some kind of a status update would be helpful. You know, like upgrading streetlights to LED. You know, maybe so have, update us when they're done. Or we have a list, and I'm trying to find it, and I'm not seeing it with the material that we have here in the weekly report. Uh, there's the ca the calendar of events. And then underneath it, it has a list of pending reports, and then also a list of pending items that need to be discussed during budget time. So there's these are items that have sort of specific council actions that are calendared, and then we uh, we took. So I think your stormwater plan is in that list of reports. Great. But I'll okay. confirm that. But I okay. think it is. And um, just like the street lights is a budget decision, uh, so it needs to be Fair. analyzed. And so it's on yeah. that list as a budget decision. Okay. Great. I mean, I, that was um, the yes. only comments I had. Um, let's see. Do we need to? We do, well, I think we need to approve. If there is no other comments, then is there a motion regarding the strategic uh, outcomes work plan? Unless there are more. Comments. So moved. Second. Uh, further discussion. Okay. Seeing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, so motion carries. Um, thank you for putting that together. Thanks for participating. It's helpful. Well, yeah, looking Thanks forward all. to all yeah. this great work. Okay, and uh, we are 
done with our regular business, and it's only 9.40. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, okay, so uh, council reports. Anyone like to start? Oh, yeah, Donna. Uh, as much as it's great to have the flashing beacons, I find that I really don't cognize them well as a driver. As a pedestrian, you push it, and maybe it's with all the construction, especially the one down at Main and Berry Street. I just don't see it. As, and I wondered if the lighting went around the triangle that would be more. Um, we got discussing it at the May meeting at the Montpelier, uh, our transportation committee, and Jennifer and others said the same thing, Heather, that they weren't noticing them as a driver and were concerned that the pedestrians were depending on them, but for the driver they weren't easily seen. So just ask all of you to note it and where they are and how you react to them as a driver. Thank you. I think that's a very good point, and I think that uh, those flashing beacons might really be a step on the way to uh, a pedestrian uh, activated red light. That might be, you know, oh. what's supposed to happen, someone's supposed to stop anyway when you're, at, 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 when you're in a crosswalk. I don't know how feasible it is to say, well, every time someone wants to cross the street, you can activate a red light, but we may be going on that. Because it was supposed to leave some responsibility on the pedestrian to look both ways. And a light wouldn't go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Connor. All right. Got a couple things. Uh, scooter e bike update. Uh, I had my third phone call with Gotcha, the uh, company who's working with Burlington. Uh, it'll just be e bikes. Um, Starting soon there, they're expanding their program. Um, you know, they're, they're still considering us and our viability factor for them. Um, but right now we have, we have no proposals on the table for e-bikes or scooters. So I, I've sort of been holding back on having a big public input section, uh, session until we have something to have public input on. So I'll continue having conversations and I'm keeping Sue in the loop on this stuff. Uh, should have another meeting with them next week. I, I did say we'd be interested in the e-bikes too, just given the starfished shape of Montpelier here. Uh, it was kind of embarrassing on Halloween when I was trying to ride a scooter up a hill, and a bunch of trick-or-treaters were actually passing me, just walking, <laughs> uh, sort of making fun of me, something awful. Uh, so I keep everybody posted, but we still have 116 survey results from the previous pilot run, as well as the analytics that Bird gave us. Um, so we'll keep everybody posted on that. Uh, a couple other things, just piggybacking off, I think Lauren brought it up last time, we passed, it, passed our single-use plastics ban, the legislature thought it was such a good idea that they passed it statewide. <laughs> it's on the governor's desk right now, um, because we passed it by an overwhelming majority there. If anybody's interested in seeing this go into effect, I give the governor's office a call at 802-828-3333 um, over the next couple of days. I think that would be important. And lastly, um, I just wanted to flag, like in our last budget, we appropriated $2,000 for child care at city council meetings. And just with July coming up, um, I don't know if city staff's been thinking about this at all, but I do have a contact in Pittsburgh uh, where it's a very successful program. Uh, so I don't think we'd have to reinvent the wheel. And I, I see it being a pretty modest program. But from night like tonight, you know, there, there are a lot of people who might have had trouble like finding child care. So it might have been beneficial. So happy to work on that with city staff if, if that's helpful. That's it for me. Thanks. I have nothing to say tonight except see you tomorrow morning at Baguito's, 830 to 930. Thank you. Jeff? Um, maybe just one thing. Tonight I uh, recently heard from a resident uh, asking us to look into an ordinance that would prohibit uh, balloon releases in the city. There's been a lot of uh, information that's come out lately about uh, balloon re releases and how they, uh, they spread this uh, toxic material all over wherever they go because every balloon that is released pops and comes back down and uh, it affects wildlife. And so I just started looking at that figuring out to figure out if that is 
something that's already within the powers and duties of the city council in the in the charter, but uh, and I'm not sure what the answer is yet. Maybe it is, but so I, it would be good if we could adopt it as an ordinance without having to go to uh, to the legislature. On the other hand, we could be the model for the rest of the state, like the uh, plastic bag ban. But you'll be hearing more about that. Just as a first pass, that seems very interesting to me, <laughs> and probably not surprising. Uh, but let's talk more about it. Oh, one other thing, because. Are you going to say something about about winning the championship? Oh, I well, was I not. I well, was not. okay. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to blow your own horn, <laughs> but congratulations to the Montpelier Boys and Girls Ultimate Teams for winning the state ever first ever state championship and congratulations to our mayor and and coach for for one thing getting the uh state championships established and two leading those teams to victory it's uh, it's really i think ultimate is really uh, a great sport in terms of uh, contribution to uh, physical fitness stamina um, eye hand coordination and uh, good sportsmanship and the great the most important value of the whole sport which is the spirit of the game and for uh, for Anne to take such a lead at uh, at promulgating that through our youth is just a great thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I uh, it's incredibly satisfying to uh, get ultimate to this point, and it it uh, um, you know I. I don't usually like to toot my own horn, so it's you know it's, it's a little weird to say, it, but it it really was historic uh, like for the country, um, you know to to have that happen, and um, it's 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 very exciting. I mean, the national organization USA Ultimate is um, regularly in touch with uh, myself and other um, coaches who are influential in making this happen because they want us to be a model uh, for the rest of the country, and uh, we. We all are sort of aware that this is the direction Ultimate is going, and uh, it's uh, it's just very exciting to be out front. So thanks. Yeah. That's cool. Right. <laughs> and it's over. Whew. And the season's done, and I can move on with my life. OK, great. Phew. Awesome. Anyway. And now it's your report. Oh, right, right. I'm up. OK. Um, so. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we had two different conferences happening uh, in Montpelier the last uh, last week, uh, downtown uh, in historic preservation as well as an arts uh, conference. And I, as far as I know, they were huge successes and uh, my goodness, brought so many people to town. And I don't know if you got a chance to go to the party on Langdon Street, but that was very fun. Um, it was pretty, uh, pretty exhilarating there. Um, and uh, yeah, hope that we can continue to have um, such conferences. That that was great. Uh, so that was uh, one thing I wanted to highlight. I also wanted to highlight uh, just the the new painting that's on uh, the Heaney lot. That's uh, just super cool to see some uh, public art happening uh, right in our downtown. Uh, besides that, I just want to also um, note that I am uh, really interested in. And a few upcoming conversations, um, we've talked a little bit about um, having a night dedicated to tr all things transportation uh, in Montpelier. It'll probably be a Wednesday night. That's not a regularly scheduled uh, council meeting uh, where we'll get a lot. It's, there'll be no, you know, no motions to be passed necessarily, but, uh, but just get updates and, and get some information. Um, there, I'm looking forward to that. Um, looking forward to further conversation about energy efficiency and energy labels or profiles um, in in residential buildings. Uh, yeah, um, that that should be a, a good conversation. I want to make sure that uh, people are aware that that is happening, and we're going to intentionally reach out to stakeholder groups to make sure that we've got a robust set of input on that. And two, that I'm you know, uh, looking to have some. Um, uh, further dialogue with uh, particularly uh, residents of uh, Barry Street on the Barry, well, and and Main Street, I suppose as well, on the Barry Main Street uh, scoping study uh, as to what to do uh, 
particularly at the intersection of Barry and Maine. Um, so I've yet to iron those out. But now that the season is over and school's almost done, I have a lot more space in my brain. So I'm looking forward to um, putting those on the calendar um, sometime, likely over the summer, um, and hopefully with lots of opportunities uh, potentially for further input. So just wanted to highlight those. And uh, that is it for me. Well, I'm sorry, folks, but actually I have a really long list of okay. things. I don't usually say much. Um, first of all, I'm sure you all know uh, Peggy in, uh, in my office. If you haven't heard, her husband passed away a couple weeks ago. So we're, we've all been, been keeping her and her family in our thoughts, but I didn't know if you all had known, known that. So um, uh, also staying in my office, Crystal Chase is back. Um, after being away for more than a year, helping her daughter recover from leukemia. And I want to thanks, you know, covering for her has been sort of piecing together people at various times in various ways. And I really need to thank Sheila Healy, Cindy Larson, Lee Youngman, Jennifer Loughran, who've all been one time or another to one degree or another really filling those roles and, and just things would not have worked without them. Um, let you all know that I passed my Civil War letters over to Glenn, who's taking care of them for me. Uh, you're, you're, so you're what now? My Civil War letters. Oh, Civil they're, War yeah. letters. They're, oh. they're all going to get framed. Beautiful. Oh, wonderful. And we are the going whole to little museum thing. Yeah, yes, encapsulate great. them and frame them. I can't wait. Nice. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I'm really glad. I was really worried about carrying them around all the time. <laughs> I was afraid I was going to spill coffee on them or they're, something. They're safe <laughs> in the press. <laughs> um, and Paul Carnahan is helping with... Um, transcribing them because nice. I've only gotten so far. It's, they're very hard to read. I um, should mention that water bills are going to be due Monday since the deadline falls on a weekend. Uh, also let folks know, if anybody's still listening, that recording and vault time costs in the clerk's office are going to go up by 50% and 100% respectively next month as per the new uh, statute. So be ready for that. And last thing, I am going to blow my own horn for a little moment here, that I completed the University of Minnesota Humphreys Public Affairs Schools Certificate in Election Administration, finally, although I think I still owe them for the last bill. And also, I've been asked to speak at the biggest international hackers conference, the DEF CON in Las Vegas, on uh, an alternative uh, logical construction for protecting statewide election systems. And cool. I've given them a paper, and I'm very happy about that. Awesome. So anyway, that's all. The, the paper, it's, it's actually not very technical. I'll do yeah, it. Yeah. 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 I'll send cool. it around. Educate us. Yeah. <laughs> all right. A um, couple things. One, uh, to follow up. Uh, so for, actually, the first thing of all is while we were talking about Ultimate, we failed to mention that both of those teams w were undefeated for the entire season. Right, um, and then uh, following up on the Barry Main process, I actually had it on my list to bring up too. I have learned, um, th because I occasionally talk to our fellow staff members, that the downtown master plan that we now apparently need money for um, is getting ready to start or is starting. And one of the key pieces it needs is, is our decisions, or at least likely decisions, um, at the very least on the two, on the Barry Main intersection and the Spring Street intersection. Will they be roundabouts? Will they be um, those kind of things? Because their design will be working around our choices. So Mike Miller really hopes that we can have some sort of decision, at least on that aspect of it, maybe not necessarily taking out parking spaces and the other things, um, by the August 14th meeting or at the August 14th meeting. So whatever process we want to have, and this was news to me since I last talked to you. So um, we need to so get. When are you hoping to have that done by? Well, August, he, he, they, he actually was hoping by July, and I told him that just wasn't going to happen. And so, um, so we compromised on August 14, okay. and um, so that's one of our meetings. So, so that's going to happen. Uh, another in, uh, perhaps more interesting deadline, um, I got a call yesterday from the gentleman who is sort of the, I don't know what his actual title is, let me see if I can, he just, uh, he's the communication and public affairs manager, Nick Sherrick for All Earth Renewables. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're aware of something called uh, federal build grants. And these are new grants that support transportation infrastructure 
uh, projects, including passenger rail. And uh, apparently this year, half of the total money goes to rural areas and for the grant from all of Vermont is considered rural. And they're for both construction and uh, infrastructure, but they can also be used for the first time this year for planning and project development. And so there's an opportunity to apply for up to $10 million for upgrades in the line between Barrie and Montpelier, as well as additional planning funds, all without a need for matching dollars. Um, and given that the transportation bill this year specifically directed VTrans to look at the Barry montpelier corridor and not anywhere else, um, they think that would be somewhat competitive. Anyway, so w there's a grant application deadline by July 15th. He actually thought it was June 15th, and he was calling me in a panic that he wasn't going to make it in time for this meeting, but it was July 15th. So at, I, I told him I believed this is something we would want to support, that it was consistent with our, our strategic plan and goals and policies. But just so you know, there will likely be an, a, an official action on your agenda to uh, approve an application for this. And I think they're going to reach out to the city of Barrie as well. So that's just an FYI. Great. Okay. And then we also need to, you already mentioned the alternate transportation forum. Oh, that was one of my questions. Should no, I was going to say, should we include the Barry Main stuff on the alternate transportation forum? But I just talked myself out of it. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so I believe there is no other outstanding business. So, um, right to without objection, we're going to adjourn the meeting. And it is 5 till 10. Oh, yeah.